House Targale, once renowned as the Emperor's Sword and the pride of the Empire, had seen its prominence wane over time. However, it would be inaccurate to simply say it declined. It plummeted to rock bottom. This led to Hergenius Targal, the eldest daughter of the house, being instructed to eat a man chosen by the emperor. Now, Hergenius was far from pleased with this directive. What made it intriguing was her contemplation that such an arranged marriage would be unimaginable in Korea. Naturally, these musings held no relevance in a world filled with swords and magic. Yet, it was evident that her genius was anything but an ordinary woman. However, while our blonde female protagonist was pondering the modern world, her now fiancé engaged in a discussion about the ground rules for their impending married life. These rules encompassed a broad spectrum of matters, such as adopting Caroxus as their middle name, limiting their shared nights to once a week for the sake of their future successor, refraining from interfering in each other's affairs, and not seeking affection or love from each other. It was challenging to gauge how much attention her genes was paying to these discussions, as her focus was primarily on the notion that she wouldn't have agreed to these terms if her family had retained its former power. Unfortunately, their influence had dwindled during her generation. Fortunately, there was a silver lining in the fact that her soon-to-be husband was remarkably good-looking. In any case, the prospect of being forced into marriage with a much older suitor remained a genuine concern. In such a scenario, the blonde lady believed she would have resorted to extreme measures, potentially even threatening the imperial family. That was her inner thought, despite her fiancé's appealing appearance. However, she couldn't help but notice his rather serious demeanour. She had been observing him closely, and it was evident that he harboured a strong confidence in his ability to make her fall for him. At that moment, her genus appeared to have everything under control, but when her fiancé inquired if she had anything to add, her composed facade shattered. She grew instantly nervous and hastily seized the contract he had prepared, eager to read it as quickly as possible, recognising it as her sole opportunity for a rebuttal. Despite her initial nervousness, her genies refused to let it overwhelm her. She swiftly regained her composure and even began to negotiate some of the rules that her fiancé had attempted to establish. However, these changes took him completely by surprise. Sleeping only once a week, what about once a month instead? Daily breakfast together. Not really necessary. Respecting each other's personal time. That needed to be emphasised. The man nearly stumbled and was visibly startled by her unexpected demands. However, her genies had no intention of relenting. She continued to amend every rule he had proposed. She went so far as to express her dissatisfaction with his tone as she reminded him that until they were married, she held a higher social status, making condescension inappropriate. It was at this juncture that our female protagonist began recounting her life in this new world from the very beginning. She was born into this world with memories of her past life. In her previous life, she came from a wealthy Korean family. She had a talent for kendo and stumbled into fencing by chance, eventually becoming a member of the national fencing team. Tragically, just as she was preparing for the Olympics, a jealous teammate pushed her down the stairs prematurely ending her life without a chance to win a medal. Afterward, she was reborn into House Targal, once known as the Emperor's Sword. Each generation of the family had produced a talented swordsman. However, for reasons unknown, such talent had not manifested for some time. Then her brother Estian was born, but he too lacked the talent for swordsmanship. As years passed, their parents passed away when they were still young and the family business crumbled, leaving them in debt. Despite their pleas, the imperial family refused to offer assistance, and the Order of Targael was disbanded. They sold everything they had to survive, barely managing to pay off their debt, and all that remained was Estienne and her. Recognising her role as the older sister, she understood the need to generate income to provide for her brother and maintain their estate. The challenge was determining how to do so. Marrying a wealthy merchant was an option, but the idea disgusted her as it did not align with her values. However, as the daughter of a count, she pondered her options for making a living. It was then that she considered wielding a sword, drawing from her past life experience. When she retrieved a training sword from storage, she felt an inexplicable connection, as if she had been a swordswoman all her life. Eventually, she realised that the true talent had been within her all along. Regrettably, during this time Estian blamed himself for their misfortunes. She couldn't reveal her intentions to him, as it was inconceivable 
for a woman to become a knight in their world. After much contemplation, she resolved to do whatever it took to keep them afloat. She sent Estian to his school's dormitory and decided to become a mercenary. To pursue this path, she had to disguise herself by cutting and dyeing her hair and binding her chest to pass as a man on the battlefield. Becoming a mercenary was relatively straightforward, as battlefields always had a demand for fighters and no one inquired about her background. She eventually aligned herself with the Valois army, which paid her well and her familiarity with the area was advantageous. Nonetheless, the life of a mercenary was far from easy. Despite her disguise, many men still perceived her as feminine and harassed her. Thankfully, she possessed the strength to put them in their place, setting an example to deter further advances. In fact, she earned the nickname Pretty Faced Monster as her fame grew. Eventually, rumours of her deeds reached the ears of Shan Kyroxus's troops, the very troops commanded by the man who would later become her fiancé. In the year 994 of the Enix calendar, during the Battle of Kirkla, the entire battlefield devolved into utter chaos, with blood staining the ground and screams echoing throughout the area. Amidst this pandemonium, Hergenes, still disguised as a man, engaged in combat against multiple foes. Fortunately, her swiftness, agility and elegant movements allowed her to repeatedly defeat her adversaries. Regrettably, their forces were vastly outnumbered, and eventually, the retreat order was issued, prompting her to follow it without hesitation, as she had no desire to meet her end there. As she made her escape, a peculiar sight caught her attention a Valorian knight charging toward one of his comrades in a treacherous assault. The victim, caught off guard, fell, while the aggressor cursed him, wishing for his demise. Initially, Hergenes attempted to distance herself from the affair, deeming it none of her concern. However, her compassionate nature compelled her to step in and aid the fallen comrade. Fortunately, the injured man was still alive and conscious. She helped him to his feet and removed him from the immediate danger. In time, she did her best to tend to his wounds and staunch the bleeding. Despite her efforts, the man's condition led him to rant about seeking vengeance against everyone, leaving Hergens to wonder about the wrongs he might have suffered to harbour such bitterness. Eventually, the man regained consciousness and, upon learning that Hergenes was a mercenary and believed her to be a man, he inquired why he had saved him. Hergenes simply responded that she had done it without any specific reason. After informing him that he was now on his own and leaving him a piece of bread, she prepared to depart. However, the man asked for her name. Dohajin suggested that he should first share his name. To her surprise, the man introduced himself as Sean Kyroxus. This revelation left her genes taken aback, as she hadn't expected such a straightforward response. Nevertheless, she honoured their deal and revealed her name as Herge. Little did she know that the man she had saved that day would eventually become her future husband. Some time later, her jeans was dining in a tavern when nearby patrons began discussing Sean Kyroxus and his remarkable rise through the ranks, despite his humble origins, to the point of leading the knights in recent battles. However, she couldn't continue eavesdropping on their conversation as a red-haired individual entered the tavern and, upon confirming her identity as the pretty-faced monster, decided to challenge her to a duel. Her jeans grasped her sword in one hand and a dagger in the other, a move that caught the red-haired man off guard. He had not anticipated facing a warrior skilled in dual wielding. Nonetheless, he retained his confidence and even inquired about how his opponent intended to defend against his attacks. In response, her jeans simply informed him that he was about to fall, and fall he did. The red-haired man was thoroughly impressed and, after introducing himself as Tarkin, extended an offer to become her partner. He even went a step further, suggesting he would willingly be her partner if she preferred it. Both offers, however, met with rejection from her genes. Sometime later, our protagonist found herself in the midst of another battle when she suddenly sensed danger and swiftly evaded a barrage of arrows. She then located the archer responsible and ascended a small hill to confront him. Despite the archer firing several arrows, her genes deftly avoided them all and eventually subdued her assailant. The archer, spared by her genes, expressed curiosity about how she had managed to dodge every arrow. Her genes nonchalantly explained that he had simply been aiming poorly. Following this encounter, the archer introduced himself as Raphine and pledged to follow her orders, as she had spared his life. 
He remained true to his word, forsaking his guild to join her ranks and even engaging in a dispute with Tarkin, the red-haired man, over the seniority rights of being her gene subordinate. Later on, some acquaintances of her genes apprehended a woman who had been posing as a man and attempting to harass her. Our protagonist, along with her two subordinates, intervened to prevent further trouble. The grateful woman expressed her gratitude, and her genes promptly revealed her own true identity as a lady. In response, the other red-haired girl inquired if she could join her group. Her genes inquired about her skills, to which the woman responded that she was an alchemist. This revelation surprised her genes, as she couldn't fathom why someone not affiliated with the military or mercenaries would be in that area. Thankfully, the red-haired woman discerned our protagonist's unspoken query and explained that she was in search of a crucial ingredient from the vicinity. Her genes agreed to her inclusion, and thus, she decided to form a mercenary group called Elazer, now comprising three subordinates. Under the banner of Elazer, they actively participated in the One Hundred Year War, aligning themselves with the highest bidder. Their involvement caused unease among both Valwar and Haglatan, and as the name Elazer gained recognition, the fateful Battle of Sean and Elazer unfolded. However, in a surprising turn of events, her genes chose to withdraw instead of engaging in combat, leaving Rafin, Tarkin, and Ivana, the red-haired woman, bewildered. Tarkin couldn't help but question her decision, but even her genes herself couldn't articulate the reason behind her avoidance of the confrontation. Consequently, the battle eventually commenced while Elazer was still on the battlefield, forcing them into combat. There, they bore witness to Sean's incredible prowess, understanding why he had earned monikers such as Monster and the Demon of the Battlefield. In truth, her genes was utterly astounded by Sean's remarkable performance on the battlefield. She not only recognized his exceptional skill but also observed his proficiency with weapons that were not his forte. However, Ivana's intervention snapped her back to reality, revealing that the entire situation had been a trap set for them. Their allies had retreated, leaving Elazer as the sole force remaining. Their quartet found themselves encircled, with the enemy leader offering them a choice, align with Haglatan and spare their lives. Yet, her genes noticed that Sean was also among their adversaries and inquired about their intentions regarding him. The Haglatan representatives didn't hesitate, expressing their desire to eliminate him due to his reputation as a monstrous and demonic figure. Her genes was not naive, she understood that the wisest course of action was to side with Haglatan. Her brother needed the financial support, and she had a responsibility to her comrades. The answer seemed clear, but her thoughts remained fixated on Sean. Fortunately, her comrades perceived her inner struggle and came to her aid, asserting that they had no desire to align with Haglatan. Moved by their solidarity, her genes, after extending her apologies, issued the order, and Elazer made the surprising choice to protect Sean. He was taken aback by this decision and questioned her genes about their motives, to which she simply responded that there was no particular reason. The battle commenced, but Sean's actions nearly resulted in her genes getting injured. In response, our main character swiftly pressed a dagger against Sean's throat, issuing a stark warning that any further endangerment would lead to his demise. Sean fell silent, and the battle continued. However, her genes couldn't help but notice an incredible synergy between herself and Sean while they fought. It felt as though they had been comrades in arms for countless years, as if their very souls were intertwined. That fateful day witnessed the Haglatan army on the brink of defeat, a situation brought about by the actions of just five individuals. This remarkable tale became the talk of the surviving soldiers, boosting the morale of the Valwar army while diminishing that of Haglatan. This legendary battle would forever be remembered as the Battle of Sean and Elazer. Thanks to this incident, the Valwar Empire emerged victorious, bringing an end to the war. Surprisingly, her genes and Sean never interacted again, their friendship was non-existent. In her role as Elazer's captain, her genes accumulated as much wealth as she could. She used this wealth to cover Eschen's tuition fees and support the state's upkeep. Then, one day, a message arrived from her homeland, informing her that her brother had suffered a fall from a horse. 
Without hesitation, she decided to return home, notifying her comrades of her choice. Initially, they feared she might disband the group, but she reassured them, promising to keep in touch. Her genes assured them that they would reunite in the future and entrusted Elazar to their care until then. Raphine, Ivana, and Tarkin became emotional, but eventually, they bid each other farewell. Unforeseen by her genes, Sean awaited her on the road. He inquired about her destination, and our protagonist replied that someone awaited them. Sean suggested that they remain, but her genes declined, insisting that they should proceed. Sean stood firm in his insistence, asserting that such actions constituted military insubordination, emphasizing his authority as the deputy commander to potentially subject our protagonist to a court-martial. Her genes appealed to him to release her, but Sean remained unwavering in his refusal. Our central character persisted, reiterating that their presence was no longer necessary, but Sean's response remained unmoved. He plainly stated that Elazar held no significance for him, his sole concern was for our protagonist. Upon hearing this, her genes erupted into hearty laughter, playfully remarking that Sean had a streak of romance in him. With a hint of jest, she added that he might owe her a favor in the future for saving him, teasingly asking him to stay alive until that day arrived. Sean responded with a promise to make an effort, ultimately relenting in allowing our protagonist to depart. Over the past three years, her genes had crossed paths with Sean on just three occasions, yet she knew those moments would remain indelible in her memory. Inwardly, she nurtured a hope that if fate ever brought them together after the war, they could engage in a formal duel to determine the superior combatant. Following that, they could share a drink and engage in conversation. However, the prospect of their reunion manifesting as a marriage was far from her expectations. Fortunately, her brother Eschen had emerged relatively unscathed, allowing her to envision a life of newfound freedom with the wealth accumulated during her tenure with Elazar. Yet, her aspirations were abruptly shattered by an imperial decree. Her genes couldn't refrain from expressing her frustration that, out of all the available suitors, Sean Caroxas had been the chosen one. She couldn't forgive Prince Raymond for leveraging her family name to bestow the title of Count upon Sean. After all, she was a decorated war hero, didn't she merit a more fitting reward? To compound her vexation, she had to take precautions to ensure Sean didn't recognize her. Just then, Sean made his entrance, bringing the narrative full circle to her genes venting her grievances about Sean's manner of speaking. Without delay, Sean offered a sincere apology and assured her of his commitment to revising the terms and promptly sending them to her. He also expressed a desire to meet her younger brother, taking our protagonist by surprise. Her genes and Sean continued their conversation, yet our protagonist couldn't shake the feeling that Sean was harboring suspicions. She had assumed he wouldn't, especially given her altered appearance, but it seemed he had detected something amiss. The dilemma lay in her inability to reveal her true identity as Herge from Elazar. It would be highly problematic if word got out that the daughter of House Targal had taken up the mantle of a mercenary, particularly since the Valwar Empire had been generously compensating Elazar post-war. The notion that they might be waiting for an opportunity to retaliate loomed large. Moreover, the close friendship between Sean Caroxas and Prince Raymond was a potential liability. The repercussions could extend to everyone in Elazar if her true identity as Herge were to surface. Consequently, our protagonist explained that Eschen was a student at Axe University, suggesting that Sean could meet him at the upcoming wedding. Sean reacted with surprise to this revelation, immediately inquiring whether Eschen shared her deep blue eyes. Her genes clarified that her brother's eye color was a lighter shade of sky blue. Sometime later, during a tea session with Raymond, the prince broached the topic of Lady Hergene's Targal, seeking his friend's opinion. Sean responded by stating that she reminded him of someone he knew, a response that caught the prince off guard. However, Sean couldn't shake the persistent feeling that her genes bore a striking resemblance to Herge. Despite the obvious differences, such as gender and hair color, she evoked memories of the man who had left an indelible impression and a debt that could never be repaid. Of course, the prince remained unaware of the full story, 
prompting him to inquire further about how her genes could possibly remind Sean of someone he already knew, and then playfully teasing him about the innocent lady marrying the so-called bad boy. Sean found amusement in that comment, for her genes defied the mold of the ladies he had encountered thus far. She possessed a strong-willed nature, uncharacteristic of a daughter from a noble family, to the extent that she approached amending the marriage contract with the determination of a seasoned mercenary. Fortunately, Raymond remained oblivious to Sean's thoughts and implored him not to divorce her, urging him to stand by her side even if he had reservations, as it would complicate matters regarding his title. Sean reassured the prince, affirming his commitment to keeping personal matters separate from his professional duties. Elsewhere, her jeans rode within a carriage and abruptly instructed the coachman to halt, citing personal matters that required her attention nearby. Some time later, her jeans, concealed beneath a hood to avoid recognition, arrived at the designated meeting place where her comrades awaited her. Upon spotting them, she greeted them with genuine happiness, catching Raphine and Tarkin by surprise. Ivana, already privy to the secret, was the first to react. While she didn't know the captain's true appearance, she easily pieced together the puzzle from the woman's behavior. Raphine was the second to discern her identity, having harbored suspicions, but Tarkin remained utterly befuddled, even entertaining the notion that her genes might be the captain's sister. Eventually, the red-haired man was enlightened about the truth, and our protagonist disclosed the purpose of her visit. She intended to unveil her long-guarded secret and also reveal her impending marriage. This revelation came as a shock to the trio, especially when her genes disclosed that her future husband was none other than Sean Caroxus. Ivana even offered to end the life of the BSTD, assuming her captain was being coerced. Tarkin then surmised that this might explain her hesitation during the battle of Sean and Elizer. He conjectured that they already knew each other by that time. Her genes attempted to deny the connection, but Raphine interjected, asserting that there was one more crucial detail she hadn't yet explained. The trio had heard about Sean's impending marriage, but their information indicated he would wed someone from House Targal. With a sigh, her genes, after apologizing for her prolonged secrecy, finally unveiled her true name. Nevertheless, her genes hastily attempted to convey that the situation was not as straightforward as it appeared due to her gender. However, Raphine interjected, assuring her that he comprehended the gravity of the situation. Revealing a woman born with such talents would undoubtedly bring disgrace to House Targal. In that moment, Tarkin finally grasped the full picture, and Ivana chided him for being a bit slow on the uptake. The trio also recognized the potential shockwave that would ensue if people discovered that Herge of Elizer was, in fact, a woman. For this reason, her genes implored them to keep the secret, and her comrades readily assured her they would protect it. Ivana even offered to create a liquid bomb in case Caroxus acted recklessly, but her genes declined the offer. Raphine proposed keeping a vigilant watch nearby and shooting him with an arrow, but her genes rejected the idea, fearing it would expose them. Finally, Tarkin suggested challenging Sean to a duel, but her genes gently pointed out that he would likely lose, leaving the red-haired man disheartened. In the end, the four of them continued to share drinks and revel in each other's company. Her genes' companions assured her that if she ever decided to make a hasty escape in the middle of the night, they would be there to support her, even if the odds were stacked against them. Some time later, Eschen returned home, and her genes greeted her younger brother with genuine joy, relieved to see him again. However, Eschen wasted no time in questioning her about the impending marriage, worried that it was somehow his fault for not excelling with a sword. His emotions welled up, and he made a promise to his sister that he would strive to be the top student in his class that semester. The siblings then delved into a discussion about the forthcoming wedding, but their conversation was abruptly interrupted by the arrival of Sean at their residence. Sean fixed his gaze intensely on Eschen, prompting her genes to realize that he had come to verify if Eschen was Herge. She even entertained the thought that Sean might have raced there just to confirm her brother's identity in case he attempted to flee. Sean calmly enjoyed a cup of tea, and when our protagonist questioned his purpose for visiting, he casually mentioned that he wanted to see her briefly and since he had accomplished that, he was prepared to depart. Her genes found this behavior rather irksome, 
as it appeared excessively convenient to her. Adding to her irritation, Sean had the audacity to inquire why she wasn't escorting him out. This frustrated her genes, given that he had been the one to arrive unannounced. Nevertheless, she acquiesced and as they walked outside, she reluctantly admitted that despite his apparent temper, he was undeniably striking. She even commented on his well-toned skin. Her genes, however, was brought back to reality when Sean suddenly took her by the waist and drew perilously close, as if preparing to kiss her. Our protagonist found herself at a loss for how to respond but eventually decided to go along with it, closing her eyes in anticipation of the kiss. However, instead of kissing her, Sean took her hand and remarked that for a noble lady, she had somewhat calloused hands. Instantly, her jeans grew nervous, entertaining the possibility that he had known her secret all along. However, she also considered the notion that he might be testing her, reasoning that if he were so certain of her true identity as Herge, he would have likely confronted her more directly. Her genes explained that her family wasn't as wealthy as other nobles, which had compelled her to engage in manual labor despite her noble status. Sharing this while being in such close proximity to him was far from easy. Sean then enveloped her in a hug, causing her to flinch. He leaned in and softly inquired about the nature of her work, whispering in her ear. Her genes reached her limit and, after pushing him away, firmly stated that they were not yet a married couple. Sean chuckled and quipped that she was stronger than she appeared. Unyielding, her genes emphasized that he had no right to handle her as he pleased. Sean's response was unexpected, he mentioned that he would have those rights after they were married. Her genes vehemently asserted that he would never have such rights, but rather than becoming angry, Sean burst into laughter. He replied that he was looking forward to it. Some time later, a fiery-haired woman stormed into Sean's study, leaving his butler struggling to restrain her. Despite the chaos, Sean remained composed even as the lady, named Cecilia, yelled at him, demanding to know if he was truly getting married. The knight calmly informed her that this was not the time for idle chatter. However, Cecilia brushed off his words and proceeded to inform Sean that nobody had any knowledge of her genes overseas business dealings. She even suggested that it might involve more than just material goods. Sean pointed out the harshness of her words, but Cecilia, undeterred, flirtatiously leaned toward him and declared her indifference to his marital status. To Sean's surprise, instead of responding to her advances, he questioned her authority to act as she pleased. He warned her that he could only tolerate her disrespectful attitude for so long, much to the amusement of the butler, who struggled to stifle his laughter. An offended Cecilia harumphed and slammed the door as she left the study. After her departure, the butler informed Sean that Cecilia had recently argued with her father, Count Epernon, regarding her potential marriage to him. Sean showed little interest in this information and instead inquired about Reeve's return, as he needed to speak with him. The butler conveyed that Reeve had not returned and provided an update on Elizer and the others, who were still working without their captain. He mentioned that they had recently gathered in secret, with Herge in attendance. Sean then asked about the progress of the investigation into House Targal. According to the butler's findings, in the year 994 of the Enix calendar, their parents had passed away, and their son Eschen had enrolled at Axe University. Her genes Targal's whereabouts during that time were unknown, but she was said to have lived overseas for business reasons. She returned to the Valwar Empire in 996 and had not left since. Sean inquired about the high tuition fees at Axe University, but the butler had no definitive information on that matter. Sean mused about the challenges of locating people after the war, considering that many never returned. He couldn't help but wonder about the past and what might have happened if he had asked Herge to stay back then. He harbored a desire to ask Herge why he had saved him, even though he suspected Herge's response would be a simple, no reason. Boldly, the butler asked Sean if he suspected Lady Herjeans might be Herge. Surprised by the question, Sean admitted that he was uncertain and expressed his curiosity about seeing her wield a sword. The butler then shared a somewhat trivial piece of information from that day's report, Master Harvin was currently crafting a rapier and a main gauche, the very weapons used by Herge. Sean was intrigued, 
as he hadn't expected the old master to accept the order, considering their previous interactions. Sean then recollected that Master Harvin reserved his craft for individuals who possessed exceptional skill, leaving only one logical conclusion. Consequently, the knight instructed the butler to keep a close watch on the smith's shop. Some time later, within the confines of the blacksmith's workshop, her jeans made her entrance, greeted by Harvin's warm smile. He even complimented his work, referring to it as a masterpiece, adorning it with intricate decorations befitting a lady. Harvin went the extra mile, enlisting a friend to create an exquisite case and belt for her new weapons. Her jeans expressed her delight and found herself reminiscing about their encounter a year prior. At that time, Harvin had taunted her when she requested a rapier and a main gauche. He playfully tossed her a wooden stick, challenging her to demonstrate her skills. In response, her jeans feigned ignorance and executed a sudden, powerful thrust that left the smith impressed. Harvin went on to reveal that she was the second person to impress him in such a manner, with Sean Caroxus being the first. This revelation caught her jeans off guard, and she inquired if he was crafting a sword for Sean. When Harvin replied in the negative, she pressed further, asking why not. The smith explained that Sean's prowess was such that the quality of the sword he wielded mattered little, whether it was crafted by the world's greatest blacksmiths or came from a humble bin. Though her jeans didn't fully grasp the explanation, she felt relieved, thinking that Sean wouldn't be coming to the shop to pick up a sword. Ultimately, she asked Harvin if he was still willing to accept her order, to which he agreed, albeit cautioning that it might take some time. Harvin then inquired about the delivery destination for the weapons, to which her jeans replied, House Targal, leaving the smith visibly shocked. Back in the present, Harvin presented both weapons to her jeans, whose eyes gleamed with admiration as she found them to be exceptionally beautiful. However, their moment was interrupted when a knock resounded at the door, causing our protagonist to freeze as she realized that the man knocking was none other than Sean. Her jeans swiftly regained her composure and concealed herself within the shop, ensuring that Sean remained unaware of her presence when he entered. Our main character then contemplated making her exit through the back door, but her plans were thwarted when she realized that the knight had brought his companions with him. Meanwhile, Sean inquired of Harvin if he could fashion a sword for him, to which the blacksmith initially declined. However, in that moment, the knight mentioned rumors of Harvin working on a new sword, prompting him to question what type of sword it was. Harvin disclosed that he was crafting a rapier and a main gauche, a revelation that took her jeans by surprise. Sean went on to inquire about the person who had commissioned these weapons, but the smith remained tight-lipped. Sean then commented on the challenge of wielding a rapier and a main gauche together, deeming it an unorthodox and potentially ridiculous combination that only someone highly skilled in swordsmanship could manage. He concluded that there was only one person capable of such a feat, Purge of the mercenary group Elazer. Harvin, much to her jeans' relief, chose to remain silent. Subsequently, her jeans planned to depart shortly after Sean, but her escape was foiled when the knight noticed the open back door of the shop. This signaled her to take action. She tore her dress to facilitate movement, used a portion of the fabric as a makeshift scarf, donned her hood, grasped the case containing the weapons, exited the shop, hurled the case as high as possible, and engaged in a swift confrontation with Sean's men in her bid to escape. Following this skirmish, she retrieved the case and was on the verge of departing the area when Sean caught up with him and inquired about the reason for his flight. He expressed his belief that they were friends and implored him to reveal the truth by turning around to face him. Regrettably, her jeans remained silent, and Sean's frustration grew, interpreting the silence as an answer. The most agonizing part for her genes was her overwhelming desire to disclose the entire truth, that she was her genes, the woman Sean was about to marry. Regrettably, she was unable to make that decision unilaterally, as revealing her true identity as Herge would endanger both House Targal and Elazer. Ultimately, she clenched her right fist, the one holding the case, and resolved to depart, leaving a disheartened knight behind. A while later, a butler delivered a report to Prince Raymond concerning the recent activities of the NX followers who had been seen wandering throughout the empire. 
The prince found this perplexing as he had not received any news regarding the supposed passing of the Dilwoods. He inquired if these followers had extended their presence beyond the holy city of Enexion. Enexism, a widely accepted religion in many nations, was led by a high priest known as the Dilwoods, who claimed to relay the word of God. The prince explained that these followers typically left the city only when it was time to select a new Ilwoods. The butler informed him that the confusion extended to other countries as well. Subsequently, the butler presented the prince with a surprising bill from Elizer. Raymond was taken aback by this development. Observing the prince's reaction, the butler mentioned that they had accrued numerous expenses in the wake of the war and that Elizer might align with Haglatan if they didn't settle the bill, given that they had already garnered Haglatan's attention. Raymond expressed his frustration, as they had even offered Elizer positions within their order of knights, but it seemed the organization's primary interest was financial gain. He then questioned the butler about Elizer's recent activities. The butler informed him that Elizer remained active but had taken on smaller, less significant tasks. The prince contemplated that if Elizer were to cease existing, they wouldn't be burdened by these payments. This remark startled the butler, who hastily emphasized that the last thing they desired was to make enemies out of Elizer. Raymond clarified that he was merely jesting and instructed the butler to settle the bill and monitor Elizer's movements closely before departing. The prince considered that he might need to discuss this matter with Sean. Meanwhile, in Targal's state, her genes reflected on her recent encounter with Sean and concluded that her decision to flee had perhaps been for the best. Moreover, wedding preparations were proceeding according to plan. At that moment, Eschen arrived, and her genes grasped his hands, noticing scars on his wrists. She pondered that it all came down to her talent, and not his, making her feel responsible for those scars. Memories flooded her mind of when her younger brother had attempted suicide due to his lack of swordsmanship skill, unable to bear the weight of not being able to protect their family. Returning to the present, Eschen offered an apology to his sister, acknowledging that it was his fault she had been pushed into this arranged marriage. Her genes reassured him, stating that she had willingly agreed to it, absolving him of any blame. Sometime later, her genes found herself donning her wedding dress, reflecting on the surreal nature of her impending marriage, feeling both hungry and constricted by the corset. Nonetheless, she summoned her strength and proceeded to the venue of the ceremony, accompanied by her younger brother. Upon her arrival, Sean greeted her, and she couldn't help but feel a surge of nervousness, recognizing his striking handsomeness. She wondered if she had always been drawn to good-looking men like him. The ceremony progressed smoothly, and the time came for the kiss. Her genes readied herself despite her extreme nervousness, but Sean took her by surprise. Instead of a gentle peck, he initiated a passionate French kiss, one that was deep and prolonged. The guests, and even the priest, began to feel a bit uncomfortable as their kiss seemed never-ending. Finally, Sean released her, and everyone began congratulating the newlyweds. Sean wore a grin reminiscent of a mischievous child who had just pulled off a prank, while her jeans blushed intensely, struggling to regain her composure and catch her breath. In response, she shot him a disapproving glance, but he simply smiled back, causing her to blush even more deeply. Her jeans couldn't help but ponder that their marriage was purely an arranged one, devoid of any deeper meaning, leaving her bewildered by the unexpected intensity of that kiss he had bestowed upon her. Her jeans was in the middle of a bath, still coming to terms with the fact that it was their first night together as a married couple. As she finished, a couple of maids addressed her as, Countess, serving as a reminder of her newfound status as the wife of a count. This prompted her to recall that in arranged marriages, women often had to prove their purity. She was relieved, however, that their parents were present to take care of their children during their first night, sparing her from worrying about such a daunting expectation. Entering the bedroom, her jeans was taken aback by the completely revamped decor. She thought they might have gone overboard with the rose petals strewn across the bed, so she decided to remove them and turned her attention to the food and wine on a nearby table. While sipping the wine, Sean unexpectedly entered the bedroom, startling her to the point that she choked on her drink. After regaining her composure, she explained that her nerves had gotten the best of her, 
primarily because she hadn't eaten anything all day. Sean didn't say a word and simply took a seat, creating an awkward silence in the room. Fortunately, her jeans decided to break the ice by pouring him a cup of wine. As he drank, she couldn't help but feel nervous again, considering they were about to spend their first night together. Out of the blue, Sean asked her jeans if she was hiding anything from him, emphasizing that, now that they were married, they should have no secrets between them. Her jeans, however, didn't fall for the bait and turned the question back on him, inquiring if he had any secrets of his own. In an attempt to change the mood, Sean playfully swept her off her feet and onto the floor. Following this unexpected turn of events, Sean focused his attention on her and remarked that she was indeed a woman, which irked her jeans to the point where she attempted to escape from him. However, Sean seized one of her legs, placed her face down on the floor, and positioned himself on top of her, reminding her that it was their first night. This made her jeans even more nervous, as she believed they were about to engage in intimate activities right then and there. Sean questioned whether it was her first time, prompting her jeans to react by leaping towards the bed and covering herself with the sheets. Sean, smiling at her response, approached the bed slowly. Once he drew closer to her, he remarked that they would stay awake all night if she continued with her current behavior. He then gently uncovered the sheets and confessed that, whenever he gazed upon her, a mix of emotions, including anger, welled up within him. Her unexpected reaction left her pondering whether she was burdened by guilt for various reasons, yet she hesitated to inquire about his feelings. Sean went on to admit that he harbored some lingering uncertainties, unsure of his own emotions, but he held the belief that things would eventually fall into place as long as they were together. The knight then inquired about her own feelings. As her jeans locked eyes with his deep purple gaze, she sensed an irresistible tug, but ultimately, she chose to remain silent. Sean, understanding her hesitation, reassured her that she need not respond if she didn't wish to. He recognized that it was her first experience, and while he couldn't change that fact, he was committed to ensuring her comfort and pleasure. They then proceeded to engage in a loving embrace, both reveling in the experience. Over, to Sean's dismay, he couldn't help but observe that her jean's body bore numerous scars, prompting him to inquire about their origins. Sean began a sensual exploration of her jean's hands, remarking that the calluses on them suggested she had wielded a sword in the past. Overwhelmed by a potent mix of arousal and nervousness, she eventually requested him to cease. However, he persisted, and the intensity of the sensation left her feeling powerless. In response, she clung to him tightly, moaning, her nails inadvertently leaving marks on his back. In the end, her jeans had to concede that the experience was undeniably pleasurable. The night continued but remained considerate, seeking her guidance and ensuring her comfort throughout. Sean then drifted into a dream, during which he overheard someone announcing Lady Karoxis's demise while giving birth to her child, followed by Sir Karoxis's fatal accident. This tragic sequence of events led people to believe that Sean was a demon responsible for his parents' deaths. The dream transitioned to a young Sean conversing with a woman and a man who, despite being his closest kin, declared him their servant. It was evident that his adoptive parents subjected him to harsh treatment, leaving him questioning why he endured such a tormenting existence. One day, the couple's daughter attempted to seduce him, coercing him with the threat of withholding food if he resisted. Unfortunately, her father caught them in the act, and she quickly shifted the blame onto Sean, accusing him of seduction. As time passed, people continued to exploit him, eventually leading him to exchange his body for shelter and sustenance, gradually inflicting trauma upon him. Hence, when war erupted, he eagerly joined the battlefield, preferring to fight rather than endure his wretched circumstances. Tragically, a traitor attempted to take his life, and as his consciousness waned, his hatred only grew. However, he didn't succumb to death, as a benevolent individual intervened, showing kindness without expecting anything in return. This newfound compassion left Sean determined to survive, hoping to reunite with this mysterious savior and seek answers. Later, a subordinate informed Sean that something was amiss, as Herge was preparing to depart, bidding farewell to the members of Elazer.
Sean sprinted as fast as his legs could carry him, all the while desperately hoping that Herge wouldn't depart. He was even prepared to offer money or perhaps even a noble title to dissuade him. Eventually, Sean managed to catch up with Herge, only to abruptly awaken from his reverie. As he gazed upon her jeans, he found her undeniably beautiful, yet there was an enigmatic quality about her, setting her apart from the other women. It soon became evident that he hadn't initially intended to spend the night with her, but witnessing her enjoy a solitary celebration altered his plans. He began to consider her as a woman of mysteries, even speculating that she might be Herge in disguise. Nevertheless, he acknowledged that regardless of her identity, that night was truly unforgettable, and her company had succeeded in diverting his thoughts from Herge. Some time later, her genes awoke and observed Sean, believing he possessed a distinct charm. The knight awoke shortly thereafter, catching her in the act of staring. Her genes inquired about his night's rest, and when he greeted her with a cheerful, good morning, she couldn't help but blush intensely, pondering the reason for her racing heart. Taking advantage of her flustered state, Sean planted a gentle morning kiss on her, causing her cheeks to flush even more. Though they were now a couple who had spent the night together, she remained puzzled by his sudden friendliness. Attempting to rise, she experienced discomfort, prompting Sean to inquire about her well-being. Wincing, her genes attributed her pain to a certain someone. Sean expressed his belief that there was more to the story, and our protagonist reluctantly agreed, admitting that the experience hadn't been entirely pleasant. He playfully suggested that next time, he would ensure it was far more enjoyable, prompting the woman to request that he cease his teasing and help her to her feet. Sean obliged and advised her to rest that day, as they had a busy day ahead. Before departing, he cautioned her not to place too much trust in the servants and maids from the Imperial Palace. Her genes reminisced about how the Imperial Palace had dispatched servants and maids to House Targal, resulting in the reassignment of the existing staff to more menial tasks. She was well aware that this gesture wasn't solely an act of courtesy. That's why she had mentioned to Sean that it appeared His Highness didn't have complete trust in him. Sean, however, took it in stride, attributing it to his upbringing. Subsequently, he drew closer to her, gently patting her, and asked for their cooperation in making their marriage a success. Our protagonist attempted to feign discomfort at the patting, but once he had departed, she found herself repeatedly glancing at the door, absently touching her head, her cheeks tinted with a blush. Later, she received a congratulatory gift from His Highness, a necklace accompanied by two earrings, all three adorned with large diamonds that exuded opulence. Overwhelmed by the grandeur, her jean struggled to maintain her composure and expressed her gratitude. Regrettably, her reaction may have seemed excessive, leaving the maids with the impression that the lady was unimpressed by the sizable diamonds. Nonetheless, the maids swiftly regained their composure and informed her jeans that, as the Countess of House Targal, she would now be expected to attend social gatherings regularly. This triggered memories for our protagonist, who recalled her previous debut in high society. However, her family had already fallen on hard times then, and she had garnered little attention. Moreover, her recollections revealed that the men of high society often indulged in discussions about women, with stories of harassment and extramarital affairs being bragging points. It was commonplace for nobles to maintain multiple lovers even if they were married. As someone with memories from a modern society, she couldn't relate. Nevertheless, she recognized that from that point onward, she would be wielding a fan instead of a sword, attending parties instead of heading to war. Meanwhile, elsewhere, a butler reported to a noble that the Targal Countship wedding had concluded. The noble referred to it dismissively as the act of an insignificant fool becoming a Targal. He then instructed the butler to dispatch the prepared gifts while expressing his discontent after spotting some dirt on the balcony railing. The butler noticed this reaction and the source of the noble's displeasure, promptly setting out to clean the railing. The noble couldn't help but think that, noble, perfect, and, beautiful, weren't the most fitting words to describe Sean Caroxas. Back in her jeans's study, she paused in her writing to massage her shoulders, feeling relieved that she and Sean worked well together. She moved to the balcony, stretching her limbs, and mused about Sean's demeanor, 
perceiving him as someone who followed his own desires yet always respected her opinions and kept her informed. Ultimately, our protagonist flung herself onto the bed, pondering whether he would return that day or not. She reminisced about how, following their first night together, Sean had been occupied at the Imperial Palace, preventing her from seeing him, despite his assurance that he would be back that day. A conflicting blend of emotions washed over her. Part of her wished he wouldn't return, while another part longed for his homecoming. Her genes found herself grappling with an unfamiliar uncertainty, believing she might be starting to miss him. However, she quickly dismissed this notion, vehemently denying any sense of longing as she abruptly sat on the edge of the bed. Chiding herself for entertaining such thoughts, she began rummaging beneath the bed. Before long, she retrieved her two cherished companions, her rapier and main gauche, deciding to amuse herself with them in the belief that Sean wouldn't be returning home that night. Yet, almost immediately, she detected a noise that put her on high alert. A group of assassins materialized in the room from above, prompting her to adopt a defensive stance. The intruders meticulously searched the entire room, and one of their underlings informed their leader that the lady was Sean's wife, a revelation that startled the boss, who had expected Sean to have returned from the palace by then. Simultaneously, her genes contemplated her best course of action. She was confident in her ability to dispatch the assassins, but the subsequent cleanup presented a substantial challenge, especially given her inability to have their lifeless bodies sprawled across the bed. A tense silence hung in the room, and eventually, the assassins decided to launch an attack. Rather than launching an offensive herself, her genes proposed a different approach, expressing her predicament and a willingness to let them depart without further conflict. She even offered to refrain from inquiring about their employer if they left discreetly. Unfortunately, the assassins failed to take her seriously and pressed on with their assault, compelling her genes to unleash her formidable combat skills upon them. Her prowess proved so overwhelming that she didn't even need to unsheath her weapons to incapacitate them. However, this meant the confrontation could continue, prompting her genes to shift her strategy. With no time to waste, our protagonist boldly challenged the assailants, fully intending to face them all head-on. Kalia stood as the most notorious band of assassins in Valwar, and on this particular night, their target was none other than Sean Caroxus, the celebrated war hero. This mission was undeniably a formidable undertaking for their guild, but two compelling reasons led them to accept. Firstly, a substantial, unrestricted reward awaited them. Secondly, an insatiable curiosity had gripped them regarding Caroxus, a man whispered to be a demon. However, within the ranks of the assassins, doubt began to creep in as events unfolded differently from their expectations. One of the assassins observed his injured comrade and considered the possibility of a broken bone, yet when he glanced at the lady before him, he realized that couldn't be the case. She exuded an aura of delicacy and hadn't even unsheathed her sword, yet she challenged them to attack her all at once. This discerning assassin quickly deduced that she was no ordinary countess. The assassins, as a collective, launched their assault simultaneously but found themselves swiftly defeated by a unique technique. Subsequently, her genes held her sheathed sword against the neck of the remaining assassin, the one who had been analyzing her, and inquired if they were affiliated with Kalia. The assassin was taken aback, as he couldn't fathom how she had identified them so swiftly. Her genes perceived his surprise and inquired about it. She reminded him that only Kalia possessed the prowess to accomplish such feats in all of Valwar. She issued a stern warning, emphasizing severe consequences should they divulge what they had witnessed. The trembling assassin quickly nodded, contemplating that their grim fate might involve torture to extract information. He even contemplated whether taking their own lives might be the more merciful option. However, to his astonishment, she ordered him and his comrades to leave. Her decision startled the assassin, and just as he was processing this unexpected turn of events, she decided to hurl them through the window, assuring them that the fall wouldn't prove fatal due to the grass below. Some time later, Sean arrived and was taken aback to find her jeans awake and closing the window with a slight wobble. Her jeans noticed him and greeted him, moving toward him and mentioning feeling a bit dizzy. The Count also approached her, and as they drew close, 
he leaned in and admitted that he had left her alone for too long. This admission startled her momentarily, but she quickly responded, suggesting he needn't have rushed. She inwardly pondered how she could have made the place spotless had he arrived a bit later. They locked eyes for a moment, and then she inquired about how busy he had been and how many days he had been away. Yet, Sean's response did not come immediately, leaving her feeling slightly apprehensive. After a prolonged pause, Sean asked if she had been waiting for him. This inquiry took her by surprise, but she swiftly regained her composure, explaining that she had indeed been anticipating his return, as there were numerous matters pertaining to their countship she wished to discuss with him. Her response, however, seemed to cast a shadow over Sean's demeanor, a fact not lost on her genes, who began to doubt if she had given the right answer. At that moment, a flashback transported them back to the palace a few days prior to this event. During that time, a noble who took issue with some dirt on a balcony railing had offered his congratulations to Sean. The Count had respectfully acknowledged the gesture, attributing his success to the noble's support. The blonde noble then mentioned sending a small gift to celebrate Sean's wedding, casually referring to his wife as a peddler who had worked overseas. Sean, deeply offended by the derogatory term, challenged the noble to clarify his words, asserting that it sounded like an insult to his wife. He hoped this was not the noble's intention, albeit with a threatening undertone. This confrontation momentarily startled the noble, but Sean quickly reverted to his genial self, apologizing for his lack of familiarity with noble etiquette, given his history as a battle-hardened swordsman. He excused himself and departed. Sean couldn't shake the feeling that the nobles looked down upon merchants, and he despised seeing the nobles' smug expression as he slighted her jeans. If this had been a battlefield, he would have had no qualms about eliminating him. Later, Sean found himself with the crown prince and inquired about when he could return home. This question surprised the prince, who remarked that it was a rarity and suggested the next thing might be pigs flying over the border. Despite this, they continued with their work. Yet, Sean couldn't shake the unease stemming from the noble's mention of her genes. He began contemplating whether she would prefer the tea he was drinking or the wine she had consumed on their wedding night. His thoughts were abruptly interrupted when the prince revealed his dark request, to dispose of Eleazar for him. The prince went to great lengths to emphasize that, officially, he wouldn't be associated with the matter. However, Sean's response took Raymond by surprise as the Count stood up with an angry expression and pointed out that even animals knew when to show gratitude. This reaction sent shivers down the prince's spine, causing him to tightly grip the armrests of his chair. Raymond decided to let the issue rest, and Sean, after bowing deeply, requested forgiveness for his abrupt outburst. The Count recognized the need to clarify some matters and disclosed that the captain of Eleazar had once saved his life, a revelation that left the prince shocked. Sean then offered to handle any outstanding payments related to the matter, but Raymond indicated it wasn't about money. Instead, he revealed that he wanted the mercenaries of Eleazar to pledge their loyalty to the empire. This unexpected declaration surprised the prince, who admitted his previous attempts at persuasion had failed. Sean, however, displayed unwavering confidence and promised to convince the Elazer mercenaries to become Knights of House Targal. Returning to the present, we shift to Sean's perspective as he arrives with her genes. When he tells her he had left her alone for too long, he wonders what might happen if she were to express how lonely she had felt during that time. Strangely, despite still having nightmares about the women who had abused him and demanded comfort, he found himself looking forward to hearing those words from his wife. With an effort to remain composed, he suggests they have a conversation. Her jeans agrees, and they make their way to a terrace where they dine and share wine. Despite the pleasant atmosphere, Sean doesn't shy away from the uncomfortable question, asking her jeans if she hates him. She appears puzzled by the sudden query, while Sean is convinced she must hate him, considering their history. After all, he had presented her with a contract on the day they first met and taken over her family's estate. He reflects on how he had been nothing but harsh to her. Nervously, Sean takes a gulp of wine, but her genes seems unfazed by the question as she calmly sips her wine. Eventually, she responds, asking why she should hate him. 
Sean, anticipating various reasons, urges her to tell him anything. Her Jean seizes the moment and explains that there are indeed many reasons. She characterizes him as a complete scoundrel, noting his self-centeredness and cold demeanor toward others. Sean scoffs in response, confirming her assessment. He then asks if there's anything else, and she counters by inquiring whether he enjoys being humiliated, to which Sean humorously replies that it's like music to his ears. This surprising exchange prompts Sean to burst into laughter. Following his laughter, he expresses his belief that she resents him, and she asks why. Sean suggests it's because of his title. Her genes reveals that Eschen, her brother, had no intention of becoming the Count, as he couldn't at present. She, too, couldn't assume the role of the Count. Ultimately, she states that she doesn't really mind, as long as he adheres to their contract. She also confesses that despite their arranged marriage, a part of her had wanted to see him again after the war, considering Sean's power and wealth, which could aid Eschen. Sean, while gently caressing her hair, expresses concern that she might regret their situation. Then, leaning in, he unexpectedly clings to her, causing her genes to feel a sense of nervousness. She wonders about the sudden change in his demeanor, as he draws closer, and she acknowledges the arranged nature of their marriage, but adds that it's not a bad one. As she rises, she stumbles, but Sean reacts swiftly, catching her. In an unexpected turn of events, he takes advantage of the moment to kiss her. Well, he attempted to kiss her, but her Jean swiftly placed her hand over his mouth to prevent their lips from making contact. She reminded him that they had agreed to reserve such moments for once a month. Afterward, she turned and left, leaving him perplexed. The following day, her Jean's found herself in a carriage, reflecting on the events of the previous night. She couldn't help but wonder why she had spoken those words and why she had tried to kiss him. Blushing deeply, she even entertained the thought that he might be developing feelings for her. However, she had a schedule to adhere to, so she shook her head to snap out of it. That day, her agenda included attending a tea party hosted by House Epernon, with the invitation coming from Cecilia Epernon, renowned as the trendsetter of high society. As she approached her destination, she recollected that the guests consisted solely of single young ladies and those who had married at a young age. This led her to believe that perhaps she could make a friend or two that day. After a while, a stunning lady positioned herself in front of her jeans, introducing herself as Cecilia of House Epernon. Her jeans reciprocated the introduction, but it didn't take long for her to realize that this entire affair was a trap. Her suspicions were confirmed when she found herself assigned to what seemed like the less prestigious table. Her jeans was quite irritated by this, as she believed they were equals, yet Cecilia had chosen to dismiss her in this manner. However, as time passed, her jeans began to contemplate whether it was all that bad, albeit still annoying. She couldn't help but wonder about Cecilia's motives. On the other hand, the other ladies at the table seemed thrilled by a fancy tea set imported from the Ryo Kingdom, leaving her jeans baffled as to why they were so enamored with ceramic pieces. Subsequently, a fellow lady at the table praised the Epernon Countship, even commending the elegant napkin folding. This time, her jeans wasn't annoyed, in fact, she agreed that the napkins looked charming that way. However, she soon resumed her complaints, this time about the green tea being served when she preferred black tea. At that moment, one of the ladies seated with Cecilia criticized the tea for being overly bitter, prompting another to question if it was supposed to taste that way. Cecilia remained silent, unsure of how to respond, while the other ladies debated the tea's flavor, suggesting that it might be the tea leaves. Her genes interjected, explaining that green tea should be brewed with cooled water to avoid bitterness. Her remarks silenced the room, and Cecilia couldn't help but wonder how her genes possessed this knowledge, as she believed her own countship had introduced green tea to Valwar. The ladies exchanged puzzled glances, uncertain of how to proceed. Finally, the lady seated beside her genes suggested that perhaps it was the tea leaves causing the bitterness. Another lady tested her genes' theory and confirmed that the tea tasted better when brewed with cooled water. This revelation impressed the other ladies but left Cecilia seething with anger. 
Her genes noticed her reaction and realized that, unintentionally, she had wounded Cecilia's pride. She mused that her knowledge of green tea likely stemmed from her familiarity with the Ryo kingdom, which bore similarities to ancient Korea. Her genes also regretted that the hosts had likely invested a considerable amount of money in the tea sets, and she had disrupted their enjoyment. Nonetheless, Cecilia managed to regain her composure and thanked her genes for helping them appreciate the tea. She then invited her genes to join her. Her genes hesitated but couldn't think of a valid excuse to decline, so she reluctantly complied. Once seated, Cecilia introduced her as Countess Targal, prompting the other ladies to realize that she was Sean's wife. One of them even inadvertently blurted it out and quickly apologized, explaining it was an old habit of hers. The conversation among the ladies then shifted to Count Targal's popularity in high society, with discussions about how many ladies had shed tears over him. Cecilia, too, confessed to admiring him and described him as a true hero who attended to everyone's needs. These words infuriated her genes to the point where she clenched her dress, and she couldn't help but inquire if he was still involved with other women these days. Her face betrayed her anger, leaving the other ladies too frightened to respond. Her genes then turned to Cecilia, who was equally shaken, and demanded an answer to her question. Cecilia found it hard to believe the turn of events. She had expected her genes to be the one feeling intimidated by them, but the opposite was true at that moment. Her genes persisted in demanding an answer for the third time, and Cecilia finally responded, denying any wrongdoing and stating that nothing of that sort had occurred. Her genes thanked her for her honesty and then excused herself, explaining that she wasn't feeling well and needed to leave. Back in her estate, her genes unleashed her fury on a salad, to the extent that one of the maids asked if she would prefer a different dish. Her genes declined, citing her lack of appetite, all the while seething with anger. She contemplated leaving everything behind and returning to Elizer, especially considering that Eschen had grown up and was capable of making a living on his own after graduating. She even pondered the possibility of the Valwar Empire pursuing her, resolving that she could cross the border if necessary. However, these thoughts did little to quell her anger. In fact, her rage intensified as she wondered what Sean had done in the past to warrant hearing such rumors. She reminded herself that while it might be common for men in the empire to have multiple lovers, that didn't apply to her man, Sean. Her frustration culminated in her raising her fist just as Sean arrived, finding her in that fiery state. Her genes turned to face him, her anger palpable, which put him on edge. She approached him, and when they were in close proximity, she informed him that she had attended a tea party hosted by House Epernon that day. Sean sensed that something had gone wrong upon hearing that name and mentioned that he had something to tell her. In response, she ordered the maids to leave them alone. Once they were alone, Sean acknowledged that even though he didn't know the details of what had transpired at the tea party, he felt it was all his fault. Her Jean sighed and asked if that was all he had to say. Sean then offered an apology, which only exacerbated her irritation. She snapped at him, insisting that if he wanted to make things right, he should allow her to have her moments of indulgence. Naturally, Sean was upset by her words, which, in turn, further infuriated her. He made an effort to calm down, but her genes questioned what there was left to care about between them. After all, their marriage was based on a contract, so she suggested that they should also respect each other's personal lives. She turned to leave, but he seized her hand and implored her to stay. She demanded that he release her, but instead, he embraced her and begged her to stay. Ultimately, she agreed to stay but insisted that he tell her what he had done wrong. Sean then confided in her genes, revealing something he had never disclosed to anyone before. He expressed his uncertainty about where to begin, leaving her genes wondering if he would abandon her as he had done with previous women if she were to fall deeply in love with him. As she tried to turn away, he firmly grasped her shoulders and knelt before her, pleading desperately. Although the sight almost made her genes burst into laughter, she managed to restrain herself, realizing the depth of Sean's desperation. He swore earnestly that he had not engaged in any shameful activities since their marriage, prompting her to inquire about his actions before the wedding. This question left him uncomfortable, leading her to chuckle. 
he vowed that such behavior would never recur. Afterward, her genes contemplated their situation and eventually suggested amending their contract. From that point on, they would only share the same room when she desired it, and they would use separate rooms in the interim. Although this proposal was hard for him to accept, she argued that they needed some time apart. This decision left him utterly devastated. Later, he stood on a balcony, contemplating the unprecedented situation. Until now, he had never faced defeat when it came to women. He couldn't help but wonder if his desire to prevent her departure stemmed from the belief that she might be Herch. His thoughts were interrupted when one of his subordinates appeared, and Sean inquired about their progress. The subordinate reported that it was challenging to infiltrate the location and inquired about their affiliation with House Targal. He mentioned that they were growing impatient and that Marlowe, in particular, was eager to return to the role of a butler. Sean pressed Reeve, the newcomer, to get to the point. Reeve then revealed that they had located Elizer near Manuaf Square and noted that Elizer seemed to be inactive. He inquired about when Sean planned to meet them. Sean contemplated the fact that despite their potential as war heroes, the mercenaries' status might lead to opposition from the nobility if they were integrated into Targal's army. He acknowledged that if not for Raymond considering him a partner, he might have had to commit treason to protect them. Finally, he assured Reeve that he intended to meet them as soon as possible. Meanwhile, in an opulent hall, the assassins gathered for a meeting. One of them questioned whether it was too late to decline the job, to which another replied that they would all face dire consequences given the identity of the person who had requested their services. Some of them who had become fans of the Countess mentioned her kindness. Their leader cautioned that while the Countess had shown kindness by letting them go, she would undoubtedly kill them if they returned. This terrified everyone, but their leader proposed a solution and revealed a blank check. His plan was straightforward yet clever, they would pass on the request to someone else. He already had the ideal candidate in mind, Elizer. Some time later, within Elizer's headquarters, the mercenary group received an unexpected visitor who appeared visibly uneasy. Curious, the mercenaries inquired about his presence, and he explained that he had come to propose a job. Tarkin found this statement rather amusing and questioned whether the assassins were currently recruiting mercenaries to carry out their tasks. Nevertheless, it was Raphine who took the initiative and introduced himself. In return, the visitor, named Epin, identified himself as the guildmaster of Kalia. This revelation surprised Raphine, as he hadn't anticipated Epin's affiliation with that particular guild. Epin then confessed his shame and revealed that his guild had recently failed to fulfill a request, which left the trio even more taken aback. Raphine inquired about the target of their mission. Summoning his courage, Epin handed them a blank check and earnestly implored them to accept the job, emphasizing that the fate of Kalia hung in the balance. Ivana swiftly took hold of the check, confirming its authenticity before Raphine had a chance to react. Both she and Tarkin began plotting how to use the money while considering sending Raphine to carry out the task. However, Raphine remained focused and reiterated his question regarding the target. Epin disclosed that their target was none other than Sean Karaxis Targal and mentioned that when they had arrived, only the Countess had been present. This revelation sent the trio into a frenzy, and they even contemplated killing Epin. However, they quickly regained their composure and decided to gather more information before taking any drastic actions. Meanwhile, the assassin began connecting the dots, analyzing the swordsmanship of both the Countess and Herge, realizing they were the same person. The trio noticed the assassin's deduction and seriously contemplated the idea of eliminating him. Just then, another individual arrived, prompting Ivana to instruct Epin to conceal himself. Moments later, Sean entered the premises, and the trio greeted him. The assassin contemplated using a poison sword, as Sean seemed unarmed and focused on Elizer. However, Epin was frozen in place by Sean's mere presence. Meanwhile, Ivana extended an invitation for Sean to take a seat and offered him a drink. Raphine quickly intercepted the drink, suspecting it to be poisoned. This irked Ivana, but Sean appeared unconcerned, as he had no intention of consuming it. 
Raphine then inquired about the purpose of Sean's visit, and the Count got straight to the point, asking how they felt about joining the Order of Targal. Let's rewind the story and shift the perspective to Sean. The Count found himself inside a carriage with Reeve, who was explaining that the Annexion followers were on a quest to find a demon capable of ending the world during the millennium. Reeve, finding the notion utterly preposterous, couldn't help but voice his disbelief. However, Sean remained indifferent to the entire topic. Observing the Count's disinterest, Reeve prodded further, wondering if there had been a quarrel with his wife. This inquiry snapped Sean out of his reverie and confirmed Reeve's suspicion. The Count, in turn, sought Reeve's advice on understanding what women appreciated. Reeve was taken aback by this question, recalling that Sean had never bestowed gifts upon the women who pursued him before. In fact, he would hardly spare them a glance. Thus, Reeve assumed Sean would treat her jeans Targal in a similar manner. Reeve suggested that Sean strive to gain favor with her family, mentioning that Countess Targal had a younger brother. He also informed Sean about Eschen's university, which hosted two forums annually, during which outsiders were allowed onto the campus. Sean decided to attend the upcoming forum. Later on, the carriage was halted by the coachman, who explained that the road ahead was too narrow for the carriage to proceed. Sean disembarked, informing the others that he would continue alone. After a while, he reached his destination. Before knocking on the door, he contemplated the possibility of encountering Herge and wondered about the implications if Herge turned out not to be her genes. Ultimately, he realized that Herge would remain Herge, and her genes would remain her genes, each holding a unique place in his heart. Nonetheless, he couldn't help but feel a sense of relief when he confirmed Herge's absence behind that door. Returning to the present, Ivana's anger flared upon hearing Sean's question. However, Raphine sensed there was more to Sean's offer and asked for the underlying reason. Sean disclosed that the Crown Prince wanted to eliminate Elizer. The trio was stunned by this revelation, but Raphine quickly regained his composure and expressed their willingness to forfeit the remaining payment. He thanked Sean for the offer but conveyed that they could not join his army. Sean became visibly upset and inquired about the relationship between her genes and Herge. The Count added that if they answered that question, he would trouble them no further, but if they refused. However, Raphine interrupted him, questioning whether he was making a veiled threat. Sean clarified that he wasn't issuing a threat but pointed out that Elizer had already attracted the undivided attention of the Imperial family, making it difficult to cross borders. He mentioned that he didn't intend to keep them as his knights indefinitely, only until it was safe to do otherwise. Ultimately, he left the decision in their hands. The Count then rose from his seat, heading towards the door, and stated that he would await their response. However, just before reaching the door, he paused and expressed surprise at their new recruit, sending a shiver down Eppen's spine. Fortunately, Sean left without further comment. An irritated Raphine acknowledged that they had little choice in the matter, given the circumstances, and the others reluctantly agreed. On the other hand, Eppen wasn't upset at all, as he saw an opportunity for his guild. He proposed that Kalia also join the Order of Targal. While the trio found this idea distasteful, Tarkin inquired about how the assassin planned to make it work. The other suggested that they could pretend to be part of Elizer, even offering to have all Kalia members serve under Elizer if their idea was accepted. Meanwhile, our protagonist was receiving compliments from her maids for her stunning appearance, which boosted her confidence. Her genes had taken extra care with her appearance because that day marked the enlistment of Sean's followers into the Order of Targal, a significant event that would restore the order to its former glory, known as, the Black Ravens of Targal. She reminisced about how the Black Ravens of Targal had once been feared on the battlefield, but their power waned when an heir capable of leading them failed to materialize. The words, Black Ravens don't cry, had gradually faded into obscurity. Sean entered the room and asked if she was ready, pulling her out of her thoughts. The Count mentioned that there were some people he wanted her to meet before they visited the Order, prompting her to wonder if he had come all this way solely for that purpose. After a while, they reached another room, and Sean introduced her to Reeve Cullens, the Order's captain, and Marlowe Sepier, their butler. 
Sean instructed the two men to fetch some documents and informed her jeans that they had organized House Targle's financial records. Her jeans examined the documents and asked if all of this belonged to him. Sean responded by inquiring if she had heard of the Mackhans Corps. The Count revealed that he owned it, which left her jeans surprised, as it was the largest defense corps in the Empire. The butler attempted to intervene, but Sean insisted that she was the head of House Targle, and there should be no secrets. The butler clarified that, on paper, he was listed as the owner, but in reality, Count Targle held ownership. He added that he had been a merchant, and Sean had established the corps when they met. When her jeans asked if they had met during the One Hundred Year War, the butler confirmed that Sean had saved his life back then. As her jeans continued to peruse the documents, she couldn't help but reflect on how they had both been involved in the same war but had grown so differently. She also considered her decision to leave the battlefield a year earlier to care for her family and her refusal of the money offered to Elizer. Later, the official ceremony commenced, with Sean announcing that all of them would henceforth represent House Targle. Her jeans was taken aback by the number of people enlisting, unaware of the extent of Sean's following. However, her shock reached its peak when she spotted her comrades from Elizur among the crowd. The following morning, her jeans awoke with a desire to confront her comrades and question their unexpected presence, but her position prevented her from doing so. Fortunately, her friends devised a way to reach her room and drew her attention by tapping on one of the windows. Responding to their call, she allowed them to enter, but to her surprise, there were now four people instead of three. The new addition promptly introduced himself as Eppin from Calia, wondering if she would remember him. Indeed, she did recall him, but she was unprepared to hear that he had joined House Targal out of admiration for her swordsmanship. Raphine assumed the lead and informed her that Sean was seeking them because the palace had apparently targeted Elizur for elimination. The Count had extended an invitation for them to join the Order of Targal for protection. This news infuriated her initially, as she saw it as the palace's attempt to betray them. However, she quickly realized that Sean's intervention might have saved her friends from a dire fate. Her jeans expressed her relief at having them all together, realizing that they might have been in grave danger without Sean's assistance. Raphine, however, cautioned her, suggesting that the Count might be aware of her secret, urging her to exercise caution. Her jeans pondered whether Sean had been suspicious from the beginning and whether he might have known Herge's true identity from the start. Raphine disclosed that Eppin had visited their hideout just before Sean's arrival, and Ivana volunteered to eliminate him, provided her captain agreed, citing the risk of him spreading their secret. Nevertheless, Tarkin argued that her jeans had spared Eppin's life, and having him as a personal subordinate might be more advantageous. Her jeans ultimately sided with Tarkin's idea. Following this, Eppin pledged his loyalty, stating that he and Kalia would serve her for life. Ivana began praising her captain, but Tarkin noticed an approaching figure, prompting the quartet to leave hastily. Moments later, someone knocked on the door, and her jeans was surprised to find it was Sean. He apologized for disturbing her so late, to which she replied that it was no problem. They took their seats, but an awkward silence hung in the air. Her jeans tried to rationalize it, attributing the discomfort to the recent use of separate rooms. She assumed that Sean had come to discuss work but was taken by surprise when he invited her to accompany him to Brighton. He explained that the forum at Axe University was about to commence, and she immediately grasped his intention, deeply moved by the gesture. Expressing her gratitude while holding back tears, she thanked him, to which he responded that he simply wanted to do something she would enjoy. Meanwhile, in the palace, the crown prince praised Duke Seraph, who had previously insulted her jeans in front of Sean, for his suggestions that day. Seizing the opportunity, the noble informed Raymond that Elizur had recently joined the Order of Targal. Raymond acknowledged this fact. However, Duke Seraph remained unsatisfied with the response, expressing concern that Elizur might undertake further actions, implying that Count Targal could potentially challenge the authority of the palace. The Crown Prince thanked him for his concern but assured him that House Targal was already under close scrutiny, dispelling any need for worry. As Duke Seraph left the scene, he couldn't hide the anger on his face.
He couldn't fathom that the crown prince believed he had Sean Caroxus under control and realized that Raymond would only realize the truth when Sean betrayed him. Nevertheless, he eventually calmed himself, confident that events would unfold according to his plan. Her jeans busily packed her bags, preparing for her upcoming journey, all the while pondering the significant revelation she had received from the quartet the previous night. The shocking truth was that Duke Enoch Seraph was the one who had ordered Sean's assassination. It was a revelation she found difficult to fathom, considering that Duke Enox had supported his husband's ascent to the position of Count of House Targal. Nonetheless, her genes chose to set aside this troubling thought and focus on her immediate decision, whether to bring her weapons on the journey or leave them behind. Her thoughts drifted back to the time when the Count had extended an invitation for her to join the university. She couldn't help but contrast this newfound warmth with how Sean might have reacted before the incident. He might have been distant, evasive, or even completely dismissive had she inquired about his past or personal matters. She couldn't help but wonder if such dynamics were common in arranged marriages. Perhaps he already knew her true identity as Herge and was simply repaying her for saving his life. Ultimately, her genes decided that regardless of the truth, she would remain silent until the situation unfolded further. However, she couldn't deny that Sean's behavior was making her feel uneasy. Just then, a knock on the door interrupted her thoughts, and she welcomed Ivana into the room. Once inside, the red-haired woman thoroughly checked the surroundings before throwing herself onto her captain. Afterward, Ivana rose and began complaining about her new uniform, claiming it was too tight. Her jeans disagreed, reassuring her that she looked fantastic. Ivana responded with a tight hug, declaring that this was why her jeans was the best. The mercenary went on to express her disdain for the people in their current location, considering most of them to be fools. Her genes empathized with Ivana, recognizing that, for an alchemist, many individuals appeared intellectually lacking. Ivana then relayed the events of the day, revealing that a fight had broken out involving Sean's men. This surprised her genes, but there was more to the story. Tarkin and Caroxus had engaged in a one-on-one -on -one duel as well. Ivana proceeded to recount the details of the incidents. Evidently, the trio had been casually hanging out when others had started to complain about their lack of training. Tarkin had retorted that these individuals wouldn't last a second if they sparred with them. Predictably, this remark had quickly escalated into a series of duels, one after the other. Although the red-haired man had emerged victorious in all of them, his comrades had noticed that he had grown rusty since the war. Sometime later, Sean had arrived on the scene, and while his subordinate had attempted to restore order, Tarkin had challenged the Count to a duel, even opting to use real swords for their confrontation. Raphine displayed his confidence in his partner by wagering his initial earnings on Tarkin's performance, predicting that Tarkin would fall within the first ten swings of the duel. However, Ivana's unwavering faith in the red-haired man shone through as she placed a bet twice the amount of her first pay, betting on Tarkin's defeat within just five swings. In response, Raphine increased the stakes by betting on three swings, and Ivana doubled down on her faith by betting on a mere two swings. Tarkin reached a breaking point at this juncture and went all in, betting his entire pay on his own victory. In stark contrast, Sean appeared uninterested in the bets and graciously offered Tarkin the first move in their duel. The red-haired man accepted the offer and unleashed a devastating attack, resulting in a massive explosion. However, Sean effortlessly dodged the attack and swiftly ended the duel with a single, precise strike using the hilt of his sword. In the end, the Count instructed Tarkin and the other Elazer members to escort Herge to her destination. Ivana concluded her account by mentioning that Sean had uttered these words before departing, leaving the rest of the details to be handled by Reeve. She also noted that only her genes would stand a chance against Caroxus in a duel. Unfortunately, their conversation was disrupted by the arrival of Rosalie, who informed them that Count Targal wished to meet with her genes regarding Bryetton. Some time later, her genes arrived at Sean's office, where he promptly informed her about a minor disturbance involving the Elazer members. This news caught her off guard, and she attempted to feign ignorance, pretending that she had assumed he wanted to discuss Bryetton. 
Sean wasn't swayed by her act and reminded her that they were in this together, which was why he had shared information about the Mackhans Corps. He then asked her if she had nothing to disclose. This question prompted her to contemplate what she could reveal at that moment. Almost immediately, she realized that she couldn't divulge the truth. Just as Sean harbored uncertainties about her, she had her own doubts about him. Furthermore, she had no intention of sharing the truth while he questioned her in such a manner. Drawing nearer, her jeans leaned in and suggested that he seemed to have already made up his mind. Sean paused for a moment and acknowledged that he had asked a rather foolish question. Without further delay, he seized the opportunity to kiss her. This time, her jeans couldn't evade the kiss, but she withdrew quickly, her cheeks flushed as she covered her lips. Sean then mentioned that it appeared he would need to uncover the truth on his own. In response, she urged him to focus on discussing Bryetton. Complying with her request, the Count revealed that he had summoned her to finalize the members accompanying them to Bryetton. He informed her that her guards would be from Elazer, and Rosalie would serve as her maid. Her Jean sought confirmation regarding Rosalie's mode of transportation, to which he responded that if she was concerned about the crown prince, they could remove her from the list. She declined the offer, emphasizing the importance of avoiding unnecessary attention. However, she made it clear that even if they departed together, it didn't necessitate that they arrive at their destination together. A while later, Sean, her jeans, and the rest of their group had embarked on their journey and found themselves in the midst of a dense forest. Rosalie, in particular, was feeling the strains of travel. When the group decided to take a break and set up camp, Rosalie had to remain inside the carriage while the others attended to camp preparations. Her jeans advised her to rest and informed her that she intended to take a walk. Upon hearing this, Sean offered to accompany his wife, a gesture she accepted. Once they had distanced themselves from the group, Sean inquired about her well-being. Her jeans assured him that she had been fine, considering she had spent most of the journey seated in the carriage. She then asked about his condition, as he had been riding a horse throughout the day. Sean replied that it was a routine for him. After a while, they reached a cliff, and her jeans approached its edge, inadvertently slipping and falling. Sean was startled but reacted swiftly, attempting to grasp her. Fortunately, the cliff was not steep, and she was not in danger. In fact, she casually scratched her cheek with her finger and asked if he intended to help her up. He jumped down to her side, remarking that it would be challenging for her to climb back up with her dress. Her jeans was taken aback by this unexpected display of concern, noting that he had descended just to assist her. At that moment, a flock of birds filled the sky, and Sean mentioned that something had started. Her jeans expressed her hope that it would conclude soon. In a flashback, we saw how the couple had planned their journey. Fernando Forest, their current location, was a shortcut to Bryetton but was notorious for harboring bandits. To avoid attracting attention from the palace, the members of Calia would disguise themselves as bandits and stage Rosalie's abduction until they returned. Her jeans felt guilty for involving Rosalie but was determined to see Eschen without prying eyes. Returning to the present, her jeans suggested to Sean that the staged kidnapping might take some time, so they decided to explore further, as she had heard the sound of water nearby. Eventually, they reached a brook and continued walking until nightfall. Unfortunately, at that moment, a group of actual bandits appeared and surrounded them. The leader of the bandits inquired whether they were nobles, and when Sean confirmed their noble status, the leader declared they wouldn't be killed but demanded their valuables. Her jeans immediately sought refuge behind her husband and encouraged him to handle the situation. Sean smiled and assured her that he would take care of it, eliciting a nod of approval from her jeans. Sean swiftly began incapacitating the bandits, but some of them attempted to attack her jeans from behind. She decided to join the fray and fought back. Regrettably, at one point, as the Count turned to glance at her, she had to discard the stick she had been using as a weapon to avoid revealing her secret. Seizing this opportunity, a bandit grabbed her and held a knife to her throat, demanding that Sean remain motionless, or they would harm her. This situation left the Count seething with anger, 
and his menacing aura began to emanate, leaving her jeans uncertain about what to do next. Her jeans found herself in a situation she couldn't escape from while under Sean's watchful gaze, so she patiently awaited her husband's intervention. However, Sean's intense aura of impending violence sent shivers down the bandit's spine. Fortunately, Tarkin arrived on the scene at that critical moment, informing the bandits that he had come to spare them. He then directed their attention to a mountain summit where Ivana and Rafine were poised to incapacitate the entire group with her potions and his arrows. Tarkin inquired whether the bandits were aware of who their targets were. As their gazes shifted to the two Elazar members, they recognized the insignia. The bandit who had held a knife to Herjean's throat realized they were confronting Sir Sean. In a swift turn of events, all the bandits dropped to their knees before Sean, pleading for his forgiveness. They revealed that they had all fought in the One Hundred Year War but had been left destitute afterward, as lower-ranking soldiers received no rewards. Her jeans took the lead and asked the bandits to promise that they would seek an honest living if given the opportunity. They readily agreed. She then suggested they head to Himov, a part of Targal's territory not far from their location. She acknowledged that it wouldn't be easy, but they wouldn't starve, offering to write a letter of recommendation to help them transition from a life of banditry to lawful living. Touched by her compassion, the bandits cowed out, expressing their gratitude and vowing never to forget her kindness. With the matter resolved, everyone returned to the camp. Inside their tent, her jeans apologized to Sean for not discussing her decision with him, offering to cover any additional expenses that might arise. Sean reassured her that it wasn't necessary and proposed that after completing their task, they could visit him of to see how things were progressing. This delighted her. Her jeans then noted that she had observed he hadn't killed any of the bandits earlier. Sean admitted that he refrained from doing so because he knew she wouldn't have approved, adding that he could have handled them without resorting to lethal force. Her jeans couldn't help but blush and struggled to keep her emotions in check. Sean rose from the bed they were sitting on and left the tent, leaving her with a tinge of sadness. The following day, they finally arrived at their destination, and her jeans was awestruck by the city, port, and castle. Later, when some guards requested their identification, they were visibly surprised upon confirming that they were addressing Sir Sean Karaxis Targal. They even asked for his autograph, displaying their fandom. However, the guards had a similar reaction when they realized Elazar was present. One of them even requested more paper to collect more autographs. The heroes of the One Hundred Year War were not a common sight there. Eventually, someone inquired if Herge was with them, and it didn't take long for Raphine, Ivana, and Tarkin to beam at her jeans while the guards expressed their wish to see Sir Herge before their lives concluded. However, Raphine eventually informed them that their captain was currently undergoing extensive secret training with aspirations of becoming the ultimate swordsman. This declaration elicited enthusiastic cheers from the crowd, leaving Ivana and Tarkin unable to contain their laughter as they glanced at her jeans, who was utterly flabbergasted by Raphine's statement. Sean, who had been observing the scene, offered her jeans a knowing smile that left her feeling as if she had been caught red-handed. To conceal her blushing face, she used her hat to shield herself, vowing to be more discreet in the future. As dusk settled in, Sean paid a visit to her jeans room, inviting her to go sightseeing since they were in Brighton. She agreed, but with the condition that they would go wherever she desired. A while later, they strolled through the bustling market, her jeans wearing a joyful smile, contemplating taking Sean to a charming pink dessert cafe. However, her reverie was abruptly interrupted when something caught her attention, causing her to lose focus. Sean immediately moved to her side protectively when he realized they were facing the followers of Enix. Sean was taken aback by their unexpected presence, and her jeans snapped back to reality, admitting it was her first encounter with them. Suddenly, one of the followers bestowed a blessing upon the couple. However, her jeans had an unusual reaction to it, prompting Sean to swiftly usher her away. Their guards were bewildered by their response since they believed the followers' blessing to be a sign of good fortune. Once they were a safe distance away, Sean paused and inquired about Herjean's well-being. Herjean's nodded, though deep down, 
she was annoyed and perplexed by her inexplicable reaction upon seeing the followers. She couldn't comprehend why she had spaced out and felt disoriented upon their appearance. Unaware that she had left a strong impression on the followers, she suggested to Sean that they head back. Meanwhile, among the followers, one remarked that, it, was the one, another agreed that the wait had been worthwhile, and a third suggested reporting to Illwoods immediately, as early summer had arrived, leaving them with approximately three years. In the holy city of Annexion, Illwoods, the high priest who held sway over Annexion, was seated on his throne, listening to a fresh report from the followers stationed at the Bryetton border. He inquired if, it, was the one, and the follower confirmed that indeed, it, had been found in the Bryetton kingdom. Illwoods then revealed that he had experienced a troubling dream, causing concern for the individual delivering the report. Illwoods acknowledged that his time was running short, expressing worry and mentioning that since they had found, the one, they should also locate, the other. He reluctantly concluded that they might need to seek assistance from the Ryo kingdom. The scene shifted abruptly to a small town engulfed in flames. Her jeans stood atop a manor's roof, bewildered as she gazed upon the fiery chaos below, wondering if it was all a dream. Suddenly, Sean appeared beside her, addressing her as Herge, and his eyes held an unfamiliar intensity. He drew nearer, and before her jeans could react, he embraced her tightly and planted a passionate kiss on her lips. We last left off with Sean and her jeans sharing an intimate kiss. The scene then zooms in, capturing their passionate makeout session. They briefly break for a moment to catch their breath, but her jeans, with her striking blue eyes, notices something intriguing. She locks eyes with Sean, and they resume their passionate kissing. However, things take an unexpected turn when Sean playfully starts to untie a string, eliciting a gasp and a protest from her jeans. She continues to voice her objections as Sean teases her with a lick. Her jeans tightly grips Sean's arm while calling out his name. He seems puzzled by her reaction, but he proceeds to take a big bite, which startles her jeans and prompts her to push him away, firmly declaring that it's enough. Blushing and trembling, she opens her eyes and looks over, her gaze widening as she gasps. In a surprising twist, Sean's eyes flash purple, and he unfurls his wings with an audible flap. Her jeans is left stunned, her eyes fixed on his fully extended wing. She covers her mouth in disbelief, convinced that she must be dreaming. Suddenly, Sean reaches out for her, calling her name, and in an instant, he flies to her side, standing before her on the balcony's edge. They come face to face, and Sean tenderly brushes a strand of hair from her face. He tells her that there's no time to waste and leans closer, urging her to swear her love for him and to stay with him in this dreamlike moment. Her jeans gasps and clutches her chest, trying to make sense of what's happening. She can't see anything and flails her hands in the air until she grasps onto something warm, which feels like a hand. Sean lifts her from the bed and embraces her, patting her gently to calm her down. Her jeans, still bewildered, holds onto his face and questions if he's truly Sean. His face is initially obscured by shadows, but as a light passes, it becomes evident that it's indeed him. Her jeans breathes a sigh of relief, calling his name. Sean lovingly strokes her forehead and asks if she's alright. She explains that she had a dream, and Sean admits he stopped by because she wasn't responding, although he acknowledges it was wrong to enter without permission. Grateful for his concern, she notices they aren't fully covered and hurriedly covers up, blushing and flustered. They both tumble onto the bed with a gentle thud, landing in a tangled embrace. They gaze deeply into each other's eyes. They are both on the verge of sharing a kiss, but suddenly, Sean presses his face into the pillow beside her, nuzzling himself into it. He apologizes, explaining that if he stays any longer, he's afraid he won't be able to restrain himself. In a hurry, Sean rushes out of the room and slams the door shut, leaving her jeans stunned and covering her mouth, trying to comprehend what just transpired. Her jeans then shifts her gaze to the side, and we see Sean standing just outside the door. He buries his face in his hand, questioning his own actions, all in the dimly lit castle. Meanwhile, in another part of the castle, it's still dark, and we observe someone on the floor surrounded by scattered papers. 
When the camera zooms out, we see a group of people laughing around a blonde individual lying on the floor, near a pile of crumpled papers. The person on the floor notices their precious work has been trampled upon and reaches out, pleading for it to stop. A bully callously drags the papers across the floor and even kicks the blonde person, causing glasses to shatter. The bully half-heartedly apologizes as someone else mentions that Sir Eschen is supposed to lead the Targle's Black Ravens. This prompts further mockery, with someone remarking that Eschen can't even wield a sword yet, leading to laughter from the group. As the three bullies walk away, Eschen reaches for a book and tightly grips it, preparing to endure their torment. However, another hand, belonging to a red-haired girl, reaches for the book as well, surprising Eschen. Eschen addresses the girl as Lady Hylia Wade and puts on his glasses. Lady Hylia expresses her disdain for the bullies, referring to them as ignorant fools, and questions why Eschen Targle doesn't fight back. Eschen, looking down, apologizes. Lady Hylia recalls a previous incident during the jousting tournament where they made Eschen fall off his horse. Despite the school being in Brighton and those bullies coming from noble families, Lady Hylia believes they have no right to mistreat him this way. Eschen smiles faintly, touched by her concern. She calls his name, then reaches out to hold his hand and looks directly into his eyes, offering her help. Eschen hesitates for a moment before lowering his head and expressing gratitude to Lady Hylia for her concern. However, he shares his goal of graduating from the school as soon as possible to relieve his sister's worries. He acknowledges that his sister was the reason he could enroll in the school and can't let her fret about him any longer. Determined to save up money despite the hardships, Eschen bows down and asks for forgiveness if he's being disrespectful. Lady Hylia, visibly upset, clenches her fists near her dress and expresses her disappointment before walking away. Eschen remains bowed, trembling while clutching his books. With an unhappy expression, he lifts his gaze, realizing that the forum is approaching soon, and he doesn't want his sister to see him in such a state. Droplets of water are visible on a book he picks up, and his thoughts turn to his sister, her genes. The day brightens, and someone inquires about Ivana's appearance. Ivana compliments her genes, remarking that she looks good in everything. When her genes turns, Ivana asks if she's excited to see her brother, which elicits a smile from our female lead. Strangely, this causes Ivana to pout and blush, and she playfully tugs on her jeans' hair, causing her jeans to wince in pain. Her jeans gently scolds Ivana, urging her to be more careful with her hair. Ivana pouts and expresses jealousy, feeling that her jeans like Sir Eschen more than her. Her jeans affectionately pats Ivana's hair, reassuring her that her brother and Ivana are unique individuals, and she loves them both equally. Ivana relents, albeit somewhat reluctantly, and promises to do her best to make her jeans look beautiful, earning a soft laugh from our female lead. Later, someone descends the wooden stairs, and her jeans questions if her attire is too casual. She gazes at her outfit for the day and recalls that Rosalie would never let her dress like this, chuckling softly to herself. As she looks downstairs, she spots Sean engaged in conversation with another man. When Sean's gaze turns toward her, they lock eyes, and a stunned expression crosses his face, prompting her jeans to wonder if her outfit is indeed too casual. Sean extends his hand, suggesting they walk to Axe University together, and her jeans eagerly accepts. They smile at each other as they hold hands. In a later scene, the weather is delightful, and her jeans approaches a lady, inquiring if she knows the whereabouts of Eschen Targle. Her jeans immediately covers her mouth, realizing that she shouldn't have asked the question so directly, considering the hundreds of students at the university. The lady turns and smiles, affirming that she knows Eschen and directs her jeans to the laboratory in a nearby building. Her jeans asks if the lady knows him well, and she responds by mentioning that there isn't a person in the school who doesn't know of him. She goes on to praise Eschen's intelligence and mentions that all the faculty admire him. Now standing in front of the building, her jeans smiles, her hand over her mouth, expressing pride in her brother and marveling at his standing with the professors. She tells Sean that she's eager to see him but is abruptly interrupted by a distressing scene, someone kicks her brother aside, 
causing him to slam into a wall with a loud thud, and his glasses shatter. Her jeans begins to call her brother's name, horror written across her face. She yells out his name, her heart pounding, as she sees her brother badly bruised with his eyes closed. Her jeans feet spring into action as she dashes forward, urgently calling her brother's name. However, Sean firmly grasps her hand, leaving her with a puzzled expression. He gently shakes his head, leaving her jeans momentarily speechless. Meanwhile, the three individuals continue to harass her brother, prompting someone else to shout for attention. Sean strides over, inquiring about the situation. One of the bullies arrogantly remarks that it's evident he isn't a university student and advises Sean to mind his own business while he still can. Her jeans becomes even more infuriated, uttering her displeasure towards the bullies. Eschen makes a sound as he trembles, looking up to see a blurry image of Sean, questioning who is there. Sean then positions himself in front of the three bullies and reveals that he's here because he's Eschen's brother-in-law. The three individuals appear stunned at the term, brother-in-law. Sean steps closer to Eschen, who is on all fours, and extends his hand, encouraging the boy to go to his sister. Eschen looks up and takes Sean's hand, slowly rising to his feet. He glances behind Sean and spots his sister in the distance, her hair fluttering in the breeze. She calls out for her brother, and the two siblings embrace tightly. As her jeans clings to her brother, she looks up, and Sean nods approvingly. The bullies, still present, witness this reunion. Her jeans then turns her brother around, suggesting that they depart. As the two siblings begin to hurry away, Sean gives the bullies a stern glare, causing them to flinch. One of them questions if he is Sir Sean Caroxus, while another dismisses the idea that Sean would marry into the house of Targal, deeming it impossible. The three bullies accuse him of impersonating a war hero to belittle a noble. Sean scoffs before fixing them with a menacing glare, his aura palpable. He orders the kids to leave, sending shivers down their spines. Sean then reiterates his command, making it clear that they shouldn't make him repeat himself. This prompts all three kids to hastily flee, yelling as they go. Sean calls for Reeve, who appears out of nowhere, responding with an affirmative, yes, sir. He instructs Reeve to find out who those troublemakers were, and we see the three fleeing in the distance. Sean adds that Reeve should gather information on all of them. Later in the day, at a particular building, we observe a dilapidated room with a worn-out bed and a table cluttered with battered books. Her jeans takes in the sight as her brother stares at the floor. As he continues to gaze downward, he apologizes. Her jeans, her patience wearing thin, places her hand near her heart, wondering how this could have happened. She recalls that her brother always ranked at the top of his class, so she assumed everything was fine. She chastises herself for being naive before saying her brother's name. She then questions where he spent the money she had been sending him. Her brother's demeanor becomes even more somber as he asks how he could have possibly spent that money. He mentions that she had to work overseas to earn that money and understands that times have been tough for them. He struggles to finish his statement, but her jeans interrupts with a vehement, no. She tells Eschen that things have changed. He trembles as he begins to suggest that she might need the money if she were to get divorced. Her jeans screams her brother's name, shaking and momentarily silent. She implores him to look at her and listen, emphasizing that his actions are not helping her at all. She asks if he realizes how wealthy she has become and vows to prove it to him when he returns home for vacation. He nods in agreement, and her jeans sighs. She then inquires about the reason behind those individuals harassing him. Eschen informs her that they are from the Swordsmanship Club, to which her jeans responds with a scoff. She acknowledges that those students would likely be aware of the House of Targal's reputation in swordsmanship and their family's decline. She places her hand on her head at the thought before spotting a piece of paper on the table. Holding it up, she notices it's an advertisement for the Axe Swordsmanship Competition, open to all participants. She asks if those boys will be taking part in the competition, and Eschen mentions that he believes they are required to participate. Her jeans expresses confidence that Sean has already taught those boys a lesson. 
A dark and sinister laugh escapes her lips, leaving Eschen bewildered. As he begins to call his sister's name, she continues to entertain dark thoughts. With a smirk, she starts to crumple up the piece of paper, emphasizing once more that all participants are welcome. Later, we witness the discreet exchange of an envelope to an unidentified recipient. Eschen begins to express understanding, but her genes intervenes, insisting that he accept it. She also mentions her desire for Eschen to spend time with Sean the following day, which takes Eschen by surprise. He seeks confirmation, asking if she means the Count, to which she affirms and assures him that she'll inform Sean. Additionally, she advises him to acquire new glasses and some room essentials. Internally, she acknowledges the necessity of keeping her brother and Sean occupied for her to join the competition. Her genes then instructs her brother not to use her nickname in front of Sean, to which Eschen clarifies if she means, Herge, receiving her confirmation and agreement. She reminds him to prepare for an upcoming forum, to which he consents. Her genes embraces him firmly, her expression turning stern. As she hugs him, her gaze intensifies. Later, her head rests on her arms as she contemplates her participation in the competition. This surprises a group of individuals sitting across from her, who exclaim their astonishment and inquire if she refers to the Axe Swordsmanship competition. She affirms this, and they express their understanding but urge her to delegate the task. She declines, asserting that she must personally confront the young competitors. One of the men questions how she plans to register, given that the competition is the following day. She instructs them to register her as the Knight of Targal, prompting them to inquire about Caroxus. She explains that he will be accompanying Eschen and pleads with Raphim, who becomes silent, noticing the absence of the other two. Meanwhile, the other two individuals are seated with her jeans as Ivana suggests lacing her jeans's sword with poison. The other man proposes causing the boys long-term illnesses instead of killing them. Her jeans ultimately dismisses the poison idea and decides to adopt a disguise. Later, under a crescent moon, a candle illuminates a table where her jeans and Sean sit across from each other. They simultaneously mention the word, tomorrow, and react with surprise. Her jeans encourages Sean to speak first, and he expresses his desire to spend time with Eschen the next day. This catches her jeans off guard, as she had planned to make the same request. Sean smirks and suggests that he and Eschen have a man-to-man -man conversation. Her jeans agrees and asks if Sean can also buy her brother some new glasses and room supplies. Sean agrees, and her jeans, fidgeting nervously, mentions her desire to explore the Forum Arena with Elazar the next day. She quickly blurts out the question and thanks Sean. This surprises him, and he blushes, prompting her jeans to wonder if he expects a monetary reward, despite his wealth. She starts to ask how to thank him but is interrupted by his chuckles. Sean playfully suggests that they are newlyweds, and that their situation isn't average, to which her jeans reluctantly agrees to a single kiss. They share a kiss, leaving her jeans flustered. Sean leans in for another, but she smacks him, quickly leaves, and slams the door, bidding him good night. Sean, still smiling, holds his head. Later, a banner flaps in the wind, announcing the Axe Swordsmanship competition. An announcer excitedly declares the competition's commencement, and the crowd cheers. In the locker room, a knight remarks on the large number of participants. Her jeans, concealed under her black coat, contemplates her singular goal of challenging the young nobles, showing little interest in winning. The participants are summoned to the ring, and the crowd's cheers continue. The first match is introduced, Achilla, the mercenary versus Varnus, a knight of the Order of Targal. The crowd erupts in excitement as we are presented with the circular arena where the two combatants, Achilla and Varnus, are set to face off. Achilla comments on the fate that has brought him against Varnus, wishing for the best fighter to prevail. Varnus remains silent but internally muses about the peculiarity of wielding only one sword but decides it will suffice. A referee raises a white flag and shouts for the match to begin. Achilla charges forward, while Varnus hunches down. There's a resounding swing of a sword as Varnus swiftly flies past Achilla. Achilla raises his sword in confusion, 
and the once rowdy crowd falls into stunned silence, with mouths agape. Achilla kneels on the ground as Varnus retracts her sword. The referee declares Varnus the winner, prompting the crowd to cheer for Targal, shouting, hooray. The referee then calls for the next match, and time continues to pass. In the following matchup, a student from the Swordsmanship Club faces off against Axe University's ace, Chijin. Varnus takes note of Chijin, a renowned sword prodigy from the house of Parnan. She observes his use of a rapier and a main gauche and wonders if he's emulating her style. Chijin challenges Varnus, asking her to show her skills. The referee, a grown man, emphasizes the significance of this fight, but the impatient crowd urges him to start. Chijin strikes at Varnus' blade, and their swords clash. He makes rapid, powerful attacks for his age, impressing Varnus. However, she manages to block his strikes and maneuver around him, their blades clashing repeatedly, leaving the spectators in awe. Later, Chijin, panting for breath, lowers his hands and receives a hit from Varnus, causing him to yelp in pain. Varnus swiftly retreats after the strike. Chijin questions why she hasn't attempted to stab him with her blade and wonders why he's losing to a knight with a seemingly inferior sword. Determined not to lose, he charges at Varnus, yelling. Varnus shifts her stance, surprising Chijin by revealing she's right-handed. Varnus launches a flurry of strikes, reminiscent of a fruit ninja, sending Chijin flying and screaming in pain. She explains her technique, emphasizing the use of the main gauche to block when the opponent is close and the rapier for attacks from a distance. Varnus' final, non-connecting strike leaves Chijin trembling in fear, causing him to drop his swords and collapse to the floor. She lectures him on the use of the main gauche and rapier, referring to him as a boy. In another location, Eschen appears dazed and contemplates Sean Caroxus. He reflects on how he initially thought his sister's arranged marriage would be challenging but notes that Sean had assisted him the day before. He's amazed at how effortlessly his sister made plans with Sean and admits to being completely perplexed by the situation. There's a knock at the door, and Eschen answers it, revealing Sean in a white outfit. Eschen initially addresses him as Count Targal, but Sean corrects him, referring to himself as Sean and Eschen's brother-in-law. Eschen is nervous and stammers Sean's name, which Sean acknowledges with a nod. Sean enters the room, causing Eschen's heart to race. Sean proposes giving Eschen's room a complete makeover, prompting Eschen to exclaim, what, loudly, accompanied by a surprised sound. Eschen approached Sean, clutching a humble brown box, and explained that it contained nothing more than a collection of letters. A blush crept onto Eschen's cheeks as he admitted to this. Sean reassured Eschen that there was no need for formality when it came to discussing Eschen's sister, her genes. Eschen nodded in response. Sean suggested leaving the box with a guard and summoned a guard named Reeve Cullens, who introduced himself as the captain of the Order of Targal. Reeve gestured for the box. Sean, impatient with small talk, instructed Eschen to follow him, causing some annoyance to Reeve. They emerged into the bright daylight, greeted by a welcoming voice. Outside, Eschen was attended to by a lady who took measurements for his new outfits. Sean, unfazed, listed their clothing requirements, including casual wear, formal attire, and a suit. He reassured Eschen that they could order more if he liked them. The lady respectfully promised to provide the best Bryetton had to offer. After some time, Eschen descended a stone staircase, now dressed in a lavish and eye-catching ensemble. Sean suggested he wear that for the time being, with the intention of replacing Eschen's old clothes when the new ones arrived. Eschen hesitated, questioning why, but Sean insisted on discarding all of his old belongings and replacing them with brand new items. Eschen agreed, although he noted that most of his current belongings were still in good condition. Sean made extravagant purchases with his credit card, and Eschen found himself carrying an increasing number of boxes and items. Eschen paused to consider the considerable value of everything and wondered if it was acceptable to receive such generosity. Later, two plates of steak were set on a table where Sean and Eschen sat across from each other. Eschen began to say a prayer, but Sean corrected him, asking to be addressed by name. 
Eschen struggled to express his gratitude as Sean observed him. Sean toyed with his food before Eschen remarked that Sean hadn't needed to go to such lengths for him. Sean leaned back, crossed his hands, and assured Eschen that this wasn't specifically for him, it was for her genes. Eschen was left speechless by this revelation, reflecting on how he had no idea what was truly transpiring. Inwardly, Eschen contemplated the nature of his arranged marriage to Sean Caroxus. He had initially believed that he needed to graduate quickly in order to rescue his sister from what he perceived as a miserable existence. However, upon meeting Count Sean, his perspective had shifted. Sean raised his utensil, indicating that he wanted to share something with Eschen. This gesture made Eschen nervous, and he swallowed anxiously. With a deft movement, Sean twirled his knife and suggested that when someone provokes a fight, one should be ready to defend oneself with a knife, or even a fork, for that matter. He thrust the utensil forward, surprising Eschen. The blade appeared to fly perilously close to the boy, who, while trembling, realized that it hadn't actually come near his neck. It felt as if he had been cut, leaving Eschen to ponder the kind of person Sean was and whether his sister was comfortable with this. Sean advised Eschen that remaining passive would only make him a target for bullies, and he should do whatever it takes to stand up to them. Eschen pointed out that it was unfair for someone without a weapon, to which Sean retorted that the bullies targeting Eschen were the ones being unfair, a sentiment Eschen concurred with. They proceeded to eat their meal in silence. Sean picked up a piece of meat and inquired if Eschen happened to know her jeans's preferences. The sound of cutlery clinking echoed as Eschen asked for clarification. He wondered why Sean was posing such questions, questioning whether the marriage was truly arranged. Eschen called out Sean's name and asked if Sean had feelings for his sister. They sat in silence, with Eschen staring intently at Sean, who let out a deep sigh before confessing that he wasn't entirely certain. Eschen pressed him, asking what he meant, and Sean explained that he genuinely wished to make her genes happy. When Eschen questioned the concept of happiness, Sean affirmed that it was indeed the primary goal, leaving Eschen speechless. He sat there, contemplating the situation, and a subtle smile crossed his face, followed by a giggle. This perplexed Sean, while Eschen privately acknowledged that the two lovebirds had a long journey ahead. Despite that, he couldn't help but feel elated for his sister, her genes. In a different scene, the crowd continued to cheer for the knight known as Varnus in the ring. A defeated student surrendered, clutching his bloodied face. Varnus wore a satisfied smile as the scene revealed her, sword resting casually on her shoulder. We then observe the three bullies surrendering in their entirety, prompting her genes to express her indignation at their actions toward her brother. Varnus wears a satisfied smile, acknowledging the gratification of the moment. She emphatically declares her intention to thoroughly defeat them the next time they cross her path. Night descends upon a building. Concerned about her appearance, her genes questions Ivana about her looks, to which Ivana assures her she looks fine. Suddenly, a man announces the return of Count Targal, causing both girls to become alarmed. Her jeans hastily exits upon seeing Sean handing his coat to Reeve. Utterly delighted, she exclaims, you're here, and Sean responds with a smile, pointing out the slight redness of her face. Her jeans attributes it to just having washed up and inquires about her brother. Sean, tilting his head, reveals that he promptly purchased everything Eschen needed. This revelation confuses her jeans, prompting her to ask if they had a good conversation. Sean, clearing his throat, praises Eschen's intelligence, leaving her genes perplexed. Sean then announces his departure, dashing off into a room without looking back. Her genes, bewildered, watches him disappear, assuming Eschen must have discovered something Sean finds embarrassing. As the night progresses, a banner announces an academic forum at Axe University. Sean and her genes find themselves seated, and her genes observes the crowd, marveling at the numerous attendees. A man at the podium discusses approaching the issue with theory, sparking a dispute among her genes group about the number of questions they asked. Ivana dismisses the theory as absurd, leading to an argument with a fellow attendee who accuses her of making a student cry earlier. The audience applauds a student's finished presentation, 
and the spotlight then shifts to Eschen as he steps up to the podium. Eschen, looking sophisticated, places his book on the desk, prompting her jeans to clasp her hands together in anticipation of her brother's turn. Inaudible words spoken by Eschen captivate the crowd, concluding with thunderous applause. Ivana praises Sir Eschen, claiming he is in a league of his own, and the crew falls silent. The acknowledgement that Sir Eschen Targal delivered the best speech today elicits visible joy from the couple. Old men approach Eschen, congratulating him and inquiring if he would like to join their laboratory. Eschen thanks them before scanning the surroundings. Spotting his sister entering with flowers, he is hugged by her jeans, who congratulates him and expresses disbelief at his victory. The siblings share a joyous moment. Later, back in her brother's room, the transformation is striking. The room, now adorned with lavish items and a shiny bookcase, leaves her jeans in awe. Eschen, holding his head, reveals that Sean has generously provided everything, including clothes, surprising his sister. Her jeans remain silent as the siblings turn their gaze toward Sean and Reeve outside the room. Curious, her jeans queries Eschen about his thoughts, causing her younger brother to appear perplexed. Clarifying that she's asking about Sean, she notices a smile forming on Eschen's face. Amused, he lets out a snicker, reversing roles as now her jeans is the one left baffled. In response to her confusion, Eschen remarks that he doesn't believe Sean to be a bad person and notes his apparent concern for her jeans. Blushing, she reacts with a startled what, seemingly frozen in place as Eschen calls her name. Without warning, she playfully slaps Eschen's shoulder, eliciting an ouch from him. When he inquires about the reason for the slap, she advises him not to make such comments. Eschen, still puzzled, bursts into laughter, reveling in his sister's bright red embarrassment. Time passes, and the scene transitions to another building on a beautiful day. Rumors circulate that the Prince of Brighton admires Sean. Ivana, fixing her jeans hair, contends that her jeans is a greater war hero than Sean. Her jeans, in turn, declares that her greatest heroes are the people of Elazar, leading Ivana to assert that her jeans is the best. When her jeans inquires about a carriage from the Brighton Palace, Ivana confirms and reveals that Raphine has left a bag under her jeans seat. Confused, her jeans asks for details, and Ivana reassures her that Raphine will take care of everything. Despite her confusion, a maid calls for her jeans, prompting Ivana to encourage her to proceed and wish her a safe trip. On the street, Sean holds the door open for her jeans, offering a smile as she glances back in her striking red and black dress. The carriage wheels turn as they sit facing each other inside. Her jeans, feeling anxious, contemplates her swords under her chair, capturing Sean's attention. Concerned, he questions her about what's troubling her and what she might be hiding, leaving her visibly surprised. Her jeans nervously declines and inquires about what's on Sean's mind. Sean notices her discomfort and she continues to respond with nervousness. Internally, she acknowledges the impossibility of revealing the existence of the swords to him. With a nervous laugh, she attributes her unease to the newness of her seat. Sean reassures her, suggesting she hold on as they are nearly at their destination, and she responds with an apprehensive, all right. Later, they approach the palace, distinguished by its domed roof. Her jeans walks with her arms entwined with Sean's, admitting to never having visited the palace before. A maid instructs the countess to wait, leaving her jeans in silence as Sean glances back at her. Waving at him, she internally expresses her disdain for the formalities. Sean continues to observe her in silence before turning away, leaving her standing alone in silence. Feeling the heat, she gestures with her hand, contemplating the possibility of requesting a fan later. Amused, she envisions herself as a haughty noble covering her face with a fan and breaks into laughter. Suddenly, a peculiar individual appears, exclaiming, good heavens, and complimenting her beauty. He introduces himself as Count Parnon, prompting the maid to express concern. Her jeans wonders about this eccentric person and overhears the maids discussing an unusual event. Reflecting on the name Parnon, she recalls Chijan Parnon and realizes that the man in front of her is that brat's father. 
Stunned, she further recollects his marital status. Speaking up, she introduces herself as Countess Hergines Targal from the House of Targal in the Valwar Empire. Count Parnon delves into a discussion about her house, but the maids intervene, calling his name. Advising him to show restraint as she is a guest of the prince, Count Parnon understands the situation and asks for her forgiveness. As he extends his hand, her jeans appears hesitant, avoiding the gesture. She wonders about his peculiar behavior and questions if he has lost his composure. In her thoughts, she wishes for privacy, expressing concern about the onlookers. The maids, perplexed, contemplate their inability to intervene personally, considering Count Parnon's actions. Her jeans contemplates the motives of the peculiar man before her, harboring an urge to confront him physically. Her hands clench tightly, and the flames of her anger burn brightly. Count Parnon attempts to defuse the tension, suggesting a simple handshake. Expressing sadness at her apparent reluctance, Parnon's attempt is abruptly interrupted when someone grabs her jeans waist with a cold inquiry about Parnon's intentions. Identifying her jeans as his wife, the individual pulls her closer, and Parnon, visibly nervous, sweats under the intense glares of Sean. Sean, bewildered by the scene, wonders about the identity of this unsettling stranger. Asserting dominance, Sean menacingly grabs his wife and shoots a threatening glare at Parnon. Observing Parnon's trepidation, Sean remarks on the man's apparent unwillingness to back down easily. Her jeans, attempting to defuse the situation, introduces Parnon as Count of Bryeton. Sean, aware of the family's reputation as swordsmen, acknowledges their background. Parnon, attempting to lighten the mood, compliments her jean's beauty, prompting Sean to contemplate taking drastic measures. A maid enters, announcing that His Highness is awaiting Count Targal. With tension lingering, her jeans intervenes by grabbing Sean's hand, signaling an end to the confrontation. Smiling at Sean, she leads him forward, and Sean, still visibly perturbed, gives Parnon an indifferent shoulder treatment. Parnon, adjusting his collar, watches the couple move ahead. As they progress through the halls, Sean appears angry, while her jean sports a content smile, playfully wondering if Sean is jealous. Exiting into an area adorned with a lavish table of food, a man in royal attire welcomes the couple. They bow in return as the man apologizes for the noble's interference. Sean, now with a changed demeanor, apologizes for overreacting, attributing it to a personal matter. The royal figure inquires about the personal matter, prompting Sean to reveal an incident involving Parnon's son mistreating his brother-in-law. The royal figure expresses concern and promises to investigate, to which Sean extends his gratitude. Her jeans, amazed by Sean's eloquence, blushes when he turns to smile at her. The royal figure delves into Sean's actions at the competition, leading to the mention of Varnus. Her jeans, puzzled, tilts her head at the sound of the name. His Highness expresses his belief that the knight in question was named Varnus before inquiring if Sean is familiar with this individual. Her jeans, reacting with a gasp, turns her head to the side, visibly anxious. A tense silence ensues as Sean hesitates to respond. Concealing her face behind a fan, her jeans contemplates whether the Prince of Bryeton is aware of Varnus' connection to her, pondering her own conspicuousness. She glances towards Sean, questioning whether he possesses any knowledge on the matter. When Sean finally speaks up, her jeans is taken aback as he reveals his acquaintance with Varnus. Sean proceeds to elaborate on Varnus' involvement in a competition, disclosing that the knight had joined without notifying him. Despite scolding Varnus post-competition, Sean attributes his actions to loyalty, urging the prince's understanding. Her genes observe Sean's adept way with words, noting his persuasive skills. Sean continues, explaining that the knight's participation was motivated by loyalty and that Varnus couldn't join them this time. The prince expresses interest in meeting Varnus, acknowledging the knight's reputed swordsmanship. Sean apologizes for Varnus' absence and promises a future meeting. As the conversation unfolds, her genes, positioned in the background, begins to believe their strategy is effective. The prince reassures Sean, stating it's alright and expressing eagerness to meet Varnus in the future.
Sean then diverts the conversation by commenting on the weather, asking if it's hot. Her jeans, using a fan, acknowledges the heat, internally relieved to have a diversion. She reflects on Sean's eloquence, recognizing it as an asset. Sean's gaze shifts towards her jeans, leading to a discussion about the weather. As a flashback occurs, Sean recalls information from Reeve about three students and their families, including the revelation that a knight named Varnus participated in the sword competition. Sean, realizing that her jeans allowed his outing with Eschen easily, conceals his thoughts and continues observing her. Later, during a meal, her jeans notices Sean's atypical behavior, as he devours a dessert and drinks golden tea. She is bewildered by his sudden change in food preferences. The scene transitions to the sunset, with everyone at the gate and a carriage waiting. The prince bids farewell, apologizing and inviting them for tea anytime. Sean expresses gratitude, and as they head back to the carriage, her jeans wonders why the bodyguards are not with them. Inside the carriage, her jeans detects an unusual scent and questions a man about it. He explains that there was a foul smell, so he sprayed perfume. Her jeans, concerned about Sean's preferences, contemplates whether he approves of the scent. As the day gives way to night, a crescent moon graces the sky. The carriage ventures into the darkened forest, and her jeans leans her head against the window, gazing outward. A concern creeps over her as she notices Sean's unusual silence. Sean, struggling, emits a noise, causing her jeans to turn pale with worry. Urgently, she rushes to him, calling his name and inquiring about his well-being. Goosebumps rise on her skin as she hears him cough, and she discovers both her hands stained with his blood. Horror takes over her expression, and she urgently demands the carriage to stop. With a screech, the carriage halts, and her jeans carefully lays Sean on his back. Removing his coat, she determines to assist him in breathing. As she leans over him, he attempts to communicate the word poison. Her jeans, recalling various events, pieces together the puzzle, the deadly potion combined with something else, the strange food at the table, and the suspicious smell from the carriage. Frustration and anger surge within her, and she curses aloud. A voice then shouts a declaration of death, branding them as enemies of Haglatan. A guard challenges the intruders, only to be swiftly struck down, splattering blood on the carriage window. The realization of an ambush prompts the guards to retaliate, and outside the carriage, the sounds of battle intensify. Her jeans, determined, looks back at the injured Sean. With bloody hands, she retrieves a box secretly concealed in her seat, contemplating the consequences of revealing its contents. Aware that Sean, though immobile, is still conscious, she grapples with the dilemma of unveiling her true identity. Closing her eyes, she starts to open the box, uncertain of whether she will face death as her genes or live as hers. A brilliant flash emanates from the box as her genes contemplates her fate. She brandishes her unsheathed blade, and the rhythmic sounds of a drum resonate. Sean, turning his head, is stunned as he gazes at the blade in her hand, his facial expression conveying the unspoken truth. An intruder forcefully breaches the carriage door, leaving behind a crimson slash. Upon entering, he halts abruptly, seemingly taken aback. Her jeans, visibly furious, utters Sean's name silently. Sean, rendered speechless and trembling, witnesses her drawing her sword and letting the sheaths fall to the floor, declaring that she will provide him with the awaited answer. Assuming a dual sword stance, she observes his growing agitation and reminds him to repay her for saving him thrice before his eventual demise. Dropping his full legal name, she swiftly exits the carriage, leaving him in silence. In the dimly lit room, he lies motionless as her jeans confronts the assailant. A swift sword swing narrowly misses the top of her jeans head, causing her hairpin to cascade to the ground. Evading another strike, she retaliates with a wide blade swing, forcing three assassins to retreat. Bewildered, they inquire about her identity, exchanging nods before leaping into the air like coordinated frogs, ready to unleash havoc on her genes. As blades descend upon her, she holds her ground, realizing that all these skilled assailants are after Sean. 
Fending off their attacks, she acknowledges their expertise, concurrently grappling with the urgency of the poison spreading through Sean's body, aware that time is running out in this intense battle. Confusion fills the air as the men witness their swords emitting an eerie creaking sound. In an instant, her jeans leap skyward like a luminous beam, twirling gracefully with her blades in hand. Despite her usual aversion to bloodshed, her face reflects resolute determination as she acknowledges the necessity of ending these adversaries. Descending forcefully, she unleashes a powerful attack on one of the assassins, who manages to parry the initial strike before succumbing to a swift follow-up. In a moment of self-reflection, her genes regrets not dispatching her opponent with a single blow. A splattering sound punctuates the scene as another assassin strikes near her legs, causing her thighs to bleed. Swiftly evading a strike from the side, she gazes at her reflection on the blade, her mind focused on the imperative of eliminating these threats, akin to those she vanquished in past battles. Her sword thrusts forward, penetrating the man who missed her, and as blood drips from her blade, the remaining assassin stands in stunned silence. Hearts race as her jeans, standing with malicious intent, turns towards the remaining assassins, who admonish her not to underestimate them because of her gender. Despite the challenging terrain of fighting in heels, her jeans assumes a new attacking stance, prompting nervous gulps and even blushes from her adversaries. Suddenly, she lunges at them with a swirling aura of blue energy, leaving the men stunned. Her jeans initiates a tornado of slashes and slices, swiftly incapacitating multiple foes. The battlefield echoes with the cries of the fallen, while two men stand in fear, trembling and quivering. Amidst the chaos, one of the assailants contemplates their original mission, to face the poison Sean, and recalls their training as elite fighters. Witnessing her jeans' unparalleled skill, he marvels at the unexpected prowess of the Countess of Targal with a sword. A cascade of strikes unfolds, resembling the swift movements of a fruit ninja game. Her jeans maneuvers her blade skillfully, leaving a man with thoughts so overwhelming that lines are drawn on him like a dissection table. Taking deep breaths, her jeans acknowledges the end of the skirmish and turns her attention to helping Sean. However, the celebratory mood is abruptly shattered as her jeans notices a weapon pressed against a man's neck. Stunned, she stands frozen as the assailants warn her to step back, threatening to kill the man, revealed to be Sean, if she doesn't comply. Sean, sweating and angered, glares defiantly at the impending danger. The assailant emphasizes his threat, declaring that he will kill Sean unless her genes obeys. From a bird's eye perspective, we observe the scene unfolding, capturing her genes concerned expression and the sinister grin on the weasel man's face. Sean, still unable to speak, sweats nervously. The man commands her genes to drop her sword and move away. Complying, she lifts both blood-stained blades, letting them clank onto the ground. The odd individual giggles, reveling in the satisfaction of having someone follow his orders. A breeze sweeps by her genes as the man contemplates the extent of her compliance, questioning if she'll obey any command. His suggestive words prompt him to instruct her to approach slowly. Sean flinches anxiously as her genes takes deliberate steps closer, revealing the wound on her leg but maintaining a determined gaze. The man continues his unsettling chuckling, escalating his demands by instructing her genes to remove her dress. Sean clenches his teeth in response, and the man warns him to stay still or face consequences. Blood starts to drip, and her jeans scowls, urging Sean to remain motionless. The unsettling sound of a slip is heard, followed by a dropping noise. The creepy man is entranced as Sean's eyes take on a demonic glare. Seizing an opportunity, her jeans stand still, and as the man gets closer, she surprises him with a sudden smile. Her bloody hand delivers a powerful uppercut to his chin, causing the dagger he held to fall into her hands. She asserts dominance by pressing her heel into his body, casting a red-eyed glare. Apologizing with a menacing look, she notes her proficiency in throwing a powerful punch, humorously mentioning the impact on his hairline. The rodent-like man squeals pathetically as red liquid sprays into the air. The scene shifts to the estate at sunrise, where her jeans, carrying Sean on her shoulder, urgently calls for Ivana. Back at their estate, 
her men are astonished as her genes rushes in, informing Ivana of Sean's peril. In a candlelit room, Ivana encourages her genes to recount everything she remembers. Shaken, her genes mentions poison in the connection to the food. Ivana orders warm water, a heater, a mortar, and medicinal herbs, emphasizing the urgency. Her Jean sits by an unconscious Sean, agreeing to Ivana's directive to treat herself. Reeve looks on with a sorrowful expression. Later, we find her Jean's in bed, dazed and staring at the ceiling with a towel on her forehead. She rises and walks into a still-lit room, discovering Reeve still sitting by Sean's side. He notices her presence, inquiring about her wakefulness. Her Jean's queries the duration of her sleep, learning that it lasted about a day. Requesting Reeve to relay a message to the Bryetton Palace in her stead, she prepares to face the challenges ahead. She comments on the potential uproar if she were to personally send the message, a sentiment Reeve concurs with. Instructing him to emphasize that she is recovering from the shock of the incident, she acknowledges Reeve's likely curiosity, knowing there are details she cannot share with him. As her gaze lingers on Sean, she expresses gratitude to Captain Reeve, who remains silent even after she departs. Later, in a room with four cups on the table, Ivana addresses her genes as captain. Apologizing, her genes receives reassurance from Ivana, while others inquire about the need for an apology. Ivana explains that they detected a hint of the Haglatan accent in the horseman's speech, prompting her to have Ralphine place swords in the carriage. She reveals that the poison used reacts to a specific scent, a rare one even Caroxus would respond to. Ivana successfully detoxified it, predicting Sean's recovery by the following day, depending on the speed of his recuperation. As her genes absorbs this information, the word tomorrow hangs somberly in the air. Seated at the table, her genes contemplates a decision she must make before Sean awakens, whether to stay or flee. The weight of this choice lingers in the air as she prepares to navigate the challenges that lie ahead. She then addresses the group, revealing that Sean has discovered her true identity. A hush falls over the room, and a guy speaks up, expressing his willingness to follow her decision. Calling out to Raphine, she's interrupted by someone sharing a personal thought about Caroxus owing her for saving his life. Another guy suggests that Caroxus wouldn't hold a grudge against her, given the debts he owes. Ivana agrees, nodding in affirmation. The guy, covering his mouth, casually mentions that Sean seems to have a liking for the captain, leading to Ivana slamming the table in disbelief. Her jeans blushes, and Ivana confronts the guy, demanding an explanation. He implies that Sean's interest in the captain is evident, causing Ivana to attack him. Her jeans, stunned, agrees to talk to Sean. Later, her jeans, feeling nervous, stands at the door, contemplating seeing Sean one last time. She cautiously opens the door, thinking he's still asleep. Entering the room, the door clicks behind her. Observing Sean on the balcony, she softly calls his name, and he turns, addressing her as Herge. They stand facing each other, his eyes locked onto her. Sean reflects on his knowledge of the poison food and recalls her genes holding up a bloody hand in the carriage. He realizes that his perspective on life has changed, now considering who would protect her genes if he were gone. Determined not to die, he recalls her promise to give him the awaited answer and insists on repaying her for saving his life a third time. Sean's hand reaches out to her genes, and he embraces her, remembering their past sword fight and acknowledging his hunch about her true identity. Expressing his joy at being right, he questions why she lied to him. Herge looks upset, holding her chest and explaining that she couldn't tell him. Stunned, Sean trembles before asking if she truly believed he was on the prince's side. She nods, surprising him. Sean sighs, covering his face, then gently places his hand on Herge's face, making her blush. He assures her that he's on her side and asks if she can trust him. They share a tender moment, memories flashing before them. Purge smiles, affirming her trust and commitment to stay by his side. In a sudden, passionate moment, Sean kisses Herge, and as they continue, he questions why it feels like she could disappear. They move to the bed, and Sean asks Herge to convince him that she won't leave him. 
As he gazes upon her, she inquires about his notion of persuasion. He then runs his hands across her face, trailing down to her shoulder as he seizes the fabric. The object he holds slips from his grasp when he moves it to the side. A vivid blush paints her face at this unexpected gesture. Sean leans in, tenderly bestowing a kiss upon her, before reclining with a sigh, revealing chiseled abs beneath his shifted robe. Her jean sits up, hastily rearranging her clothing. Sean warns her that this is her final opportunity to escape his grasp. Cupping her face, he asserts that he won't let her slip away once this offer expires. She smiles, questioning why she would ever consider leaving. Placing her hand on his face, she reminds him of the debts he owes for the time she saved his life. Sean grins, asking if that's the case, then leans in for another kiss. He rests atop her, and an action on Sean's part causes her to flinch. He huffs, giving a playful lick, encountering a bandage on her thigh. Concerned, he inquires if it hurts. In her thoughts, she reflects on him being the same person who was previously coughing up blood. She retorts that he is the patient, not her. Sean, intrigued, leans over, questioning how she could label him a patient. He claims to feel remarkably well, drawing a shocked expression from her. Her jeans grabs his shoulder, asserting that she decides when they spend the night together. Sean whispers in her ear, promising to make her feel good, moving his hand sensually. As they kiss, he assures her it will be better than the first time. Later, the room is dimly lit, with white cloth scattered on the floor. A hand clenches the bed, and her jeans questions Sean's actions. With a devious look, he asks if there's a problem, stating he's making it feel good. Their kiss is noted to be better than before, and a strange sensation is acknowledged by her jeans. Sean pulls away, calling her by the name Herge again, assuring her that he'll go slow. Breathing intensifies, hands intertwine, and they share another kiss. Her jeans calls out Sean's name, and he reciprocates with endearments. She expresses her delight, placing her hand on his face, pondering the blissful experience of their embraces. As the morning unfolds, Sean sits up and tenderly places his hand over the slumbering Herjeans's head. Gently stroking her hair, he prompts her eyes to slowly open. Rising alongside him, she rubs her eyes, and he warmly greets her with a good morning. Playfully, he addresses her as Herj once more, eliciting a response as she looks back at him, calling him Sean. Expressing her discomfort at hearing him use that name, she questions if he shares the sentiment. A moment of astonishment crosses his face before he reassures her that he doesn't find it strange at all. In response, she exclaims a surprised, what? To which he reveals that he had been aware of her true identity as Herge all along. Her delighted squeal reflects her genuine surprise. Turning her head, she acknowledges her intuitive understanding of the situation, emphasizing the preference for this gradual revelation over a tumultuous unveiling of evidence and potential scolding. Sean then confides in her, expressing a long-standing curiosity. He inquires if, after the battle, she ever found herself contemplating him. The duo locks eyes in a moment of silent intensity. Her jeans breaks the silence, much to Sean's amazement. A blush graces his cheeks as he asks her the reason behind her sudden revelation. Confused, she questions if there truly needs to be a reason. Sean's heart pounds as she ponders whether he genuinely desires an explanation. Her arm fidgets as she stammers, noting his exceptional performance. Sean, contemplating the term, exceptional, sprouts cat ears with sparkling eyes, eagerly anticipating more from her. Puzzled by this transformation, her jean sits in silence, considering her words. She describes a connection between them, as if their souls were in harmony, an odd yet profound unity. Placing her hand on him, Sean seizes it, grinning playfully, teasing about the timing. He warns that if she persists, he won't hold back, acknowledging his status as a patient but expressing readiness if she desires. She slaps his shoulder, urging him to refrain from such comments, leading to another shared kiss. Post-kiss, Sean expresses a desire to ask one more thing, questioning why she chose to save him this time. She promptly responds with a nonchalant, no reason at all, 
irritating him and leading to an awkward silence. Sean suggests doing it once more, but she insists it's time to get up. The scene shifts to a bright day at the manor, sunlight illuminating the surroundings. Raphine expresses relief at not leaving the Targal house, while Ivana appears irked. The mention of her genes and Karoxis as a couple triggers Ivana's anger, directing a glare at Sean. She warns him, declaring her watchful eye on him, causing him to sweat nervously. Another character notes the apparent improvement in their situation. Later, a candlelit setting shows Sean discussing the ambush by the Haglatan with her genes. Sean reveals a secret meeting with the Prince of Bryetton and expresses his personal involvement in handling the matter. Her genes questions the possibility of another assassination attempt, and Sean playfully suggests she might save him for a fourth time. Bro's Riz comment catches her off guard, and she chases him with a pillow, frustrated with his antics. The setting shifts to the Palace of Valwar, where Crown Princess Ayelin and Crown Prince Raymond sit in awkward silence during tea time. An urgent message interrupts, revealing the impending visit of the Queen of the Ryo Kingdom to the Empire. Excitement ensues, and preparations for the Queen's arrival begin. The scene changes to an eastern-looking building bathed in sunlight. A messenger rushes in, delivering a letter from Valwar to Queen Ryo Hun. Displeased, she tosses the scroll aside, expressing reluctance only eased by Ilwood's involvement. The servant emphasizes the fate of their land, prompting the queen to consider the potential presence of the one they seek in this unfolding event. Back at the primary couple's estate, the sun begins its descent. A fire dances over a hand, sparking contemplation about the true purpose of the queen's visit to Valwar. Hergenes inquires about the queen, and Sean reveals that the queen of Raya will be arriving. Hergenes recalls the queen's reputation for never leaving her kingdom prompting Sean to speculate on the Queen's intentions. Hergenes, realizing they won't have time for a detour, mentions needing to instruct Kalia to release Rosalie, leaving Sean momentarily speechless. Sean reassures Hergenes that they can still visit him off. Excitement lights up Hergenes' face, and Sean suggests she may need to ride a horse to get there on time. Hergenes confidently accepts, reminiscing about riding with Sean on her back in the past. As the sun continues to set over the lush landscape, the couple finds themselves on horseback. Hergenes sighs in relief, noting how they made it. Observing something unusual atop a cliff, she remarks on the ongoing events. Sean mentions the previous difficulty with bandits and him off, and Hergenes recalls their earlier intervention. The scene transitions to a group of men near gates, surprised by the arrival of people on horses. They demand to know who approaches, and the main couple reveals themselves. The crowd cheers for Lord Targill, realizing Hergenes is the true lord. Demis, the keeper of Himov, introduces himself nervously. Sean corrects him, causing a humorous confusion. Hergenes questions the commotion, and Demis explains the recent bandit attacks. Sean questions the town's readiness and scolds Demis for inadequate reports. Demis, flustered, promises improvement and hurries away. Hergenes questions Sean's harshness, but he emphasizes the need to address liabilities quickly. Unbeknownst to him, Hergenes wonders if Sean is feeling jealous. Later, at the Redvo Bandits base camp, the boss discusses the challenge of taking him off due to its skilled militia. He orders the assembly of all nearby bandits for the impending attack. In the night, Hergenes strolls through the town, relieved to see him off thriving. Ivana gestures to Hergenes, discussing the potential use of hallucinogenic flowers. Hergenes, distracted, observes Sean receiving a report from Demis. She reflects on the changes in Sean, especially since he started addressing her as Herge. As she contemplates, a yell interrupts the quiet night. Bandits emerge, holding Ivana hostage, prompting the three to confront the unexpected threat with disdain. An uncomfortable silence hangs in the air as a bird's eye view captures the peculiar scenario. The individuals holding Ivana appear perplexed, puzzled by the apparent calmness of those confronting them. Amidst the tension, a pained exclamation emerges from a man who has been bitten, urging his companion to assist. Ivana, irritated, questions her captor's hygiene, while a red-haired individual mocks her for venturing alone. Her genes remain silent, observing the unfolding events. Suddenly, the leader of the bandits arrives, disdainfully inquiring if her genes and her companions represent the people of Himov. Her genes corrects him, leading to an awkward moment where the bandit mistakenly assumes her to be the mistress of the Lord. Later, within a large red tent, Sean instructs Demis on militia division. Sean, uncharacteristically concerned, orders a reduction in squad numbers. Reeve speculates about Sean's unusual behavior, suspecting it may be linked to Demis' 
blushing in Hergian's presence. A bell tolls, capturing the attention of Sean and Reeve, revealing legions of torches in the mountains arranged in battle formation. Sean, visibly angered, shares the news that Hergeens is at the border with Eliza. Reeve and Demis are stunned as Sean appoints Reeve to lead the defense of Himov, while he plans to find Eliza and Hergeens. Sean emphasizes the need to protect the people at all costs, and, if necessary, to abandon Himov. Meanwhile, the cavernous bandit leader expresses disbelief upon learning that a woman is the Lord. He boasts that Himov will soon be under his control. Hergeens, alarmed by the bell toll and torches, realizes the imminent danger. Determined to reach Sean, she commands her men to conserve their strength, revealing that Himov is under attack. She vows to eliminate the invaders swiftly and save Ivana. The bandit leader arrogantly dismisses Hergeens, prompting her to draw her sword and assume a defensive stance. The bandit leader mocks Hergeens, declaring that he won't harm her. Hergeens, unfazed, laughs lightly and warns him not to underestimate her. As the bandit leader charges forward, Calling her a little, Hergeens deftly dodges his attack and slashes him. The bandit leader, shocked by the wound, orders a retreat, revealing tears in his eyes. Hergeens, unimpressed, watches as he and his men hastily withdraw. She notes her disappointment in the lackluster challenge posed by the bandit leader. Suddenly, a noise behind her catches her attention, and she turns to investigate. She realizes there hasn't been any audible approach and ponders about the identity of the newcomer. With her sword poised defensively, Sean emerges in the moonlight, raising both hands. She calls out his name just as distant screams echo through the night. The trio of fleeing bandits is observed by the crew, and the red-haired individual comments on their insufficient numbers for a fight. Ivana brushes off the dust from her attire, dismissing the notion that she was scared, to which the red-haired guy teases her. Spotting a figure near her jeans, the red-haired guy assumes there might be remaining bandits. Eager to confront them, Ivana restrains him, and the two rush off. The main couple comes face to face, and her jeans begins to question how Sean arrived. But he steps forward and envelops her in a warm hug. Blushing, she questions his sudden appearance, and Sean explains he prioritizes her over Himov's protection. He entrusted the defense of Himov to Sir Cullens, and they can commence their strategy from the border. Hergeens instructs him to hurry. The crew halts, observing a substantial number of bandits. One suggests eliminating them all, prompting a charge. In response, Sean and Hergeens unleash blue and purple slashes, respectively. The red-haired guy wields his red blade, while Ivana and Raphine, hidden in the trees, rain arrows on the bandits. Ivana triggers explosions, creating chaos on the battlefield. Amidst the panoramic view of the intense battle, Sean and Hergeens strike simultaneously, focusing on a common foe. Sean remarks on the time passed since their last joint endeavor, leaving Hergeens in thoughtful surprise. Hergeens reminisces about their previous encounters, and with a smile, she acknowledges the joy of being with him again. Sean, taken aback, smiles warmly. As they refocus, Sean asks if they should complete the task. Night passes, and a bottle soars through the air, struck by an arrow, causing a massive explosion among the bandits. Chaos ensues as the crew targets the enemy. Raphine and Ivana collaborate, using a concoction that induces agony among the bandits. In the midst of the battle, Sean, seemingly unfazed, notices two chicken bandits bewildered by the unexpected turn of events. The bandits, unnerved by Sean's silence, label him a monster. Unfazed, Sean faces an approaching horde of attackers, who assume he's vulnerable without his sword. A silent swing of his blade sends them reeling in pain breaking his sword in the process. Unperturbed, Sean discards the broken weapon and seizes another from a fallen bandit. As three bandits prepare to exploit Sean's supposed vulnerability, a figure nears him, using Sean's back as a launch pad. In the night sky, Hergeen soars above the trees, surprising the bandits. The trio yells in astonishment before a cascade of blue sword strikes, unleashed by Hergeen's, engulfs them. Amidst the aftermath, smoking residue wafts in front of Hergeen's, who notices something in the distance. Turning her attention, she spots Reeve in the trees and instructs him to shoot, questioning if he witnessed the spectacle. Reeve gazes upward in awe while Hergeens looks down, questioning if he witnessed the extraordinary display. Meanwhile, Sean swiftly slashes through a bandit beside him and redirects his attention elsewhere. In a moment of urgency, he loudly calls out his wife's name, alerting her to the imminent danger behind her. Hergeen swiftly turns, swinging her blade to confront the threat. She apologizes to Sean, attributing the lapse in focus to making eye contact with Sir Cullens. Sean reassures her and asserts his commitment to standing by her side for protection. 
During their intense battle against a horde of bandits, Sean questions Herge about her seemingly carefree interaction with Sir Cullens. He teases her about being jealous, and she counters, stating it was due to feeling awkward. Despite their mid-battle argument, they skillfully dispatch the enemy. Sean grabs Herge's wrist, asserting he could be even more childish if he wished. As they continue fighting, a glimpse of the couple's prowess leaves four grey figures nervously observing. The bandit leader, observing Sean's relentless attacks, instructs his men to target her jeans, labeling her as the landlord. Sean's anger flares at this, and Herge, in response, calls the bandit leader an inappropriate term. Sean advances, his grip on the sword tightened, demanding an explanation for the insult directed at his wife. In a swift barrage of purple sword strikes, Sean incapacitates the bandits, leaving them sprawled on the ground. Herge, perplexed, witnesses the aftermath, and two bandits approach, seeking their captain. As Sean and Herjeans walk away, Herjeans reflects on the reason behind Sean frequently breaking his swords. Ivana arrives, handing Herge the sword case, and the red-haired guy expresses amazement at witnessing the entire spectacle. Leaning in, he questions if Herjeans truly needs to keep Sean as her husband, suggesting she get a divorce. Herjeans covers his mouth, silently communicating that such a move would have dire consequences. The red-haired guy persists, advising her to divorce given her responsibilities. Her jeans, Sean, and the crew remain silent as Sean continues battling the remaining bandits. As the day transitions into night, her jeans contemplates the events in the dark forest and the separate battles they fought. She notes that everyone, except Cullens, wouldn't have seen her. Later, Demis expresses gratitude for eliminating the bandits but questions their hasty departure. Sean reveals an urgent matter in the capital, instructing the people to continue developing him off. Demis bids them a safe trip with tears in his eyes. Despite Herge's desire to rest, Sean is determined to leave immediately. Mounted on a horse, Herjeans observes Reeve staring at her and asks Sean to wait. In the forest, Sean contemplates something and assures Herge that he'll handle it. The trio continues their journey on horseback, and Herjeans notices Reeve avoiding eye contact. As they approach a house, someone welcomes them, and Herjeans suggests freshening up. Sean swiftly removes his coat, revealing his abs. Blushing, Herjeans turns away in embarrassment. Sean, undeterred, suggests they wash up together. Herjeans contemplates the word together as she playfully shoves Sean away, expressing concern about what the maids might think. Sean reassures her, stating that no one will be allowed near the bathroom, but her jeans insists that's not the issue. She lets out a small shout as Sean grabs her and lifts her into the air, explaining that it's just a bath, and there's nothing complicated about it. However, her jeans privately acknowledges that this won't be an ordinary bath. In the tub, surrounded by bubbles, her jeans blushes, questioning the need to sit so closely in the large tub. Sean holds her head, offering to help her wash up. But she declines, noticing scars on his chest and wondering if they're from past near-death experiences. Sean startles her, grabbing her hand, and a flurry of movement ensues with large splashes. He hugs her in the water, nibbles on her ear, and gives her a kiss. As they lock lips, Herge wonders why kissing this one man makes her so nervous, feeling that she'd do better fighting with a sword and her eyes closed. In the midst of their intimate moment, Sean clenches Herge closer, prompting her to ask if they're going to take it to the next level. Sean, seemingly clueless, finally catches on, and they share a discussion about the frequency of their intimacy. Herge admits that it feels like they've been doing it too much, leaving Sean stunned and yelling in disbelief. When asked how much is too much, Sean awkwardly suggests three times a day, leading Herge to think he's insane. Sean adjusts his proposal to once a day and then once a week for their future child. Herge reflects on whether everyone is like this or if Sean is an exception. Sean finds the situation interesting and leans in, suggesting that it depends on how much she loves him. The scene becomes more intimate, involving kisses and playful interactions. Eventually, Herge decides to put a stop to it, but Sean insists on one more time. Herge wonders why she feels so weak when she sees Sean's eyes. Later, the couple is near a red blanket, and they share another kiss. Sean's hands start to wander, prompting Herge to slap him and tell him to stop touching her. Sean agrees, giving her a peck and suggesting they have a conversation since they don't get to talk much. Herge asks if they should inform the palace about him of, but Sean prefers not to discuss work at the moment. When she asks what they should talk about, Sean inquires if there's something she wants. Herge denies any specific desires, but Sean insists she think about it. Puzzled, Herge wonders if Sean is a genie for a husband and contemplates whether he'd be willing to do anything for her. She then mentions how right now he looks as though he'd be willing to give her the Valar Empire if she wanted it. He smiles at this which puzzles her. 
He says only if she wants which causes her to be shocked. He puts his hand down as he asks if they will need to start a revolt. Then, her jeans contorts her face comically at Sean's declaration and remains utterly speechless. Internally, she assumes that Sean must be jesting, considering his words as a mere joke. However, a glance into his eyes reveals a sincerity that confounds her. She finds herself immersed in a contemplation of whether to express gratitude or reproach him. Suppressing these conflicting thoughts, she realizes that the first step is to identify something she genuinely desires. Overwhelmed, she breaks into a nervous sweat, eventually suggesting that the Valwar Empire might be a bit dull. The idea of flowers crosses her mind, and she mentions that a bouquet of flowers would be a delightful gift. Sean appears bewildered by her choice of flowers and, with a cute demeanor, asks about her preferred type. Feeling a bit nervous, as it was an impulsive thought, she points to him, expressing that any flower he chooses would be acceptable. This amuses Sean, lost in thought, and her jeans giggles at his adorable contemplation. The night unfolds with a soft moonlight filtering through the window. The next morning, Sean, dressed in a black vest, kisses his sleeping wife before being summoned by a butler. Outside, a carriage awaits, and the butler hands Sean a letter addressed to Hergines. Sean flips through the papers, growing visibly angry. He recalls Hergines mentioning her desire for a simple bouquet, contrasting it with a diamond necklace Prince Raymond had sent, still untouched by her. Determined, Sean instructs the butler to prepare everything as he intends. In the morning light, Ivana, dressed elegantly, informs her jeans that she will be assisting her in the absence of the head maid. Stepping out, the butler greets her jeans with a bow, handing her a letter. Reading it, she discovers an invitation to the ceremony of the queen, where she is to collaborate with Crown Princess Ayalon and Lady Cecilia Apirian. Prince Raymond expresses gratitude and wishes her luck. Her jeans, overwhelmed, questions why she has been chosen, given her limited knowledge of Ryo. The butler adds that a luncheon with the princess awaits her, dampening her jeans' spirits further. Feeling unprepared, she anticipates an awkward luncheon. As the day progresses, Reeve approaches the butler, sharing his discovery of her jeans' sword skills. The butler, initially skeptical, acknowledges the possibility of her dual identity as Eliza Herge. The revelation shocks him, and Reeve recounts witnessing her jeans in combat. Later, her jeans, waking up alone, wonders if Sean will be late again. Frustrated, she vents her annoyance on a pillow. The door creaks open, and Sean, bearing a charming smile, surprises her with a bouquet of red roses. Overjoyed, she questions his presence, and Sean demands a kiss. After a playful exchange, he departs, leaving her in awe of the flowers. The maids announce a slew of gifts from Count Targale, overwhelming her jeans, who, in disbelief, exclaims, huh, echoing throughout the estate. In another regal establishment, a lady with dark hair graciously welcomes Countess Targale. Her jeans greets her highness, and they sit together in an awkward silence. Her jeans observes the quiet atmosphere, and the princess breaks the silence by addressing her. The princess, fidgeting with her dress, unexpectedly asks if her jeans is happy. This question catches her jeans off guard, and she contemplates the similarities between herself and the crown princess, both having been married off for the sake of their houses. The topic of their marriages becomes a hot gossip item in high society. In comparison with the princess, her jeans reflects on her personal contentment. Looking up at the princess, she contemplates sharing her perspective. However, the princess dismisses her words as nonsense, smiling and asking for forgiveness, attempting to create a more comfortable atmosphere. Her jeans responds, reassuring the princess that perfection is not necessary and she shouldn't force happiness for others. The two lapse into silence again, and her jeans covers her mouth, realizing the unintentional honesty. She internally acknowledges the societal foolishness of honesty, while the princess remains silent. The princess, clenching her hands together, admits she has never heard such words from anyone before. Blushing and smiling, she surprises her jeans. Her jeans attempts to continue the conversation, but they are interrupted by the arrival of Lady Cecilia. As Cecilia approaches, her black dress and red cloth catch attention. She eyes her jeans with evident animosity, considering her arrival for Sean. Internally, Cecilia plans to torment her jeans for stealing Sean and regrets not marrying him herself. Cecilia fantasizes about mocking her jeans' shabby dress, unaware that it's new and on display. Her jeans stands radiantly before her, and Cecilia, shielding her eyes, notes the unexpected splendor of the dress. Cecilia nervously comments on her lateness, confusing the other two. The princess corrects her, stating everyone else arrived early. Cecilia dismisses the importance of her jeans' attire, internally labeling her a country bumpkin. 
Cecilia questions if her genes and the princess spoke about something boring before her arrival. The princess blushes, claiming it was nothing, but then says it was so fun they lost track of time, surprising Cecilia. She marvels at the princess's newfound happiness, recalling her previous sadness. Angered, Cecilia calls for her highness and brings up Hergine's travels abroad, recommending her for her knowledge of Ryo's language and culture. An annoyed Hergine's notes Cecilia's persistent behavior, and Cecilia, pleased with her recommendation, suggests letting Hergine's talk about her experiences. Hergine's is visibly irritated and Cecilia, in a smug manner, giggles. However, her amusement turns to shock as she senses her genes radiating an intense, intimidating energy. Cecilia, now fearful, observes the princess's confusion. Her genes addresses Cecilia, asking if she's genuinely interested in hearing her story. Cecilia sits trembling and shuddering while her genes looks on with a smile. Internally, her genes contemplates Cecilia's likely role in her summons and her persistence in annoying her. Speaking up again, her genes dismisses the idea that her story is entertaining and might have ruined the atmosphere. She begins recounting her past, explaining that both her parents passed away when she was young, leaving her alone with her younger brother. With nothing left to lose, Hergines traveled abroad, engaging in various ventures. As Hergines mentions protecting her family's reputation, Cecilia gasps and clutches her neck. Hergines slams the table, emphasizing that despite her struggles, she didn't tarnish her family's honor. Cecilia seems affected by Hergines' words and begins to yell. Confused, the princess inquires about the commotion. Cecilia apologizes and, struggling, suggests resting. Later, the two original attendees, Hergines and the princess, discuss Cecilia's discourteous behavior. The princess asks Hergines to be understanding, but Hergines blames herself. The princess appreciates Hergines standing up to Cecilia and reveals her dislike for Cecilia's actions. The two share a laugh off screen. The princess invites Hergines to visit again, expressing how enjoyable the meeting was. Hergines agrees, and as she watches the princess and maids return to the castle, a man approaches. Noticing his noble appearance, Hergines prepares to bow, but the man unexpectedly steps in front of her. Looking up, she sees a long-haired individual wearing a monocle. He greets her as my lady, and Hergines recognizes him as Duke Enoch Seraph, Ireland's brother. Realizing their differences, Hergines feels uneasy under his peculiar gaze. Duke Enoch compliments her eyes and requests her name. Hergines reveals she is Countess Hergines Targale, surprising him. Duke Enox reaches out to her, and she flinches, wondering about his intentions. He introduces himself and requests a moment to talk. As they walk under green trees, Duke Enox praises Hergine's beauty, focusing on the significance of the color blue in House Seraph. Feeling increasingly uneasy, Hergine's contemplates running away. Duke Enox expresses a desire to touch her face, and Hergine's considers him crazy. Just as he reaches for her, Sean's shout interrupts them. Startled, Hergine's and Duke Enox turn, and Sean's hand touches Hergine's face. The Duke wears an evil expression, and Hergine's hears Sean utter the name Seraph. Sean tightly embraces Hergine's as the Duke stands before them with a smirk, hand raised. Coldly responding to Duke Seraph, Sean's glaring eyes reveal his discontent at the man touching Hergine's with his bare hands. Sean questions the encounter, and the Duke, with a smile, implies an affair, irking Sean. Sean, in turn, accuses the Duke of eyeing another man's lady. The Duke raises his hands, claiming that Sean has never been with a lady as fascinating as Hergine's, leaving Sean speechless. The Duke bids farewell, expressing hope for another meeting, and walks away. Hergines, growing infuriated, refers to him as a low-down snake, expressing a desire to punch him if not for his noble status. Twirling Hergines around, Sean calls her name and ensures she is okay. Hergines reassures him, describing the Duke's admiration for her blue eyes and attempt to touch her face. Sean, trembling, screams about the craziness of the Duke, accusing Hergines of falling into the trap. Hergines, annoyed, punches Sean, insisting that she was cautious and not oblivious to the Duke's actions. Sean questions her reaction, and Hergines clarifies her ability to handle the situation, emphasizing her identity as Herge of Eliza. After a tense exchange, Sean apologizes, admitting his discomfort with the Duke's attention. Changing the subject, Hergines asks about her appearance and the dress Sean gave her, striking a pose. Sean compliments her, leading to a hug, during which Sean makes an unexpected move that startles Hergines. The topic shifts to the undergarments Sean sent, and he playfully suggests checking for himself. Hergines, surprised, tells him not here, but Sean continues his teasing. The mood changes when Hergines mentions Lady Cecilia's presence at brunch, leaving Sean silent and worried. 
She drags him away, and they run off together. Later, at the palace door, the princess nervously observes someone mixing tea. She calls to Enox, expressing concern for Lady Targale and pleading with him not to mess with her. The Duke talks about Countess Targale's beautiful eyes and questions the princess about nightmares. As the princess trembles, the Duke assures her not to worry and encourages her to keep listening to him, revealing his manipulative intentions. A structure with a distinctive red roof comes into view as Hergene's remarks on the passage of time. Standing inside with a hat, she observes her men scrutinizing various weapons. The swordsmith queries her on the sword's current performance, noting the presence of what seems to be blood. Her jeans acknowledges its effectiveness and states her purpose for being there to order a stiletto and acquire swords for her companions. The smith agrees, and as she discusses the length of the swords, a man named Catinson calls for Master Harbin. Entering the shop, Catinson inquires about his own swords, prompting Harbin to inform him that they're not ready. Specifying his desire for a rapier, and main gauche combo like Hergines, Catinson rejects an alternative suggested by the shop owner. Hergines, intrigued, realizes that Master Harbin only makes weapons for those with the skill. Harbin challenges Catinson, stating he'll craft the weapons if the knight proves himself as skilled as Hergines. The knight turns to Hergines in disbelief, and Harbin confirms that she is indeed a lady. Catinson questions Harbin's sincerity, accusing him of taunting, and Harbin insists he won't forge the weapons unless Catinson surpasses Hergines. Nervously scratching her face, Hergines ponders the unusual situations that seem to arise whenever she visits the palace. Harvin, grinning, offers to make her the stiletto for free, and she agrees, also requesting a two-handed sword. Exiting the shop, Hergines and Catinson face each other. He introduces himself as Catinson of Roble, expressing his ambition for royal knighthood. He asks for her name, but she postpones the revelation. Despite his suggestion to remove her hat for better visibility, she dismisses it and the sparring begins. Catinson charges at Hergines, who effortlessly dodges his swings and offers guidance on improving his technique. Despite Catinson's haymaker swings, Hergines adeptly blocks and counters, ultimately defeating him. As a crowd applauds the spectacle, Hergines reminds him to keep his promise. Walking away, she hears the knight express gratitude and advises him to listen to Master Harbin. The knight asks for her name again, but Harbin mocks him, urging him to think of it as a midsummer's dream. The scene transitions to nighttime in a bustling street, where someone predicts the millennium's arrival and the end times. Catinson wonders about the mysterious girl he encountered earlier. In the moonlit night, a woman approaches a blindfolded figure standing before a statue. The queen greets Ilwoods, who acknowledges her welcome. They sit on the stairs, and the queen mentions Ilwood's discovery of someone, specifically Count Targale of Valwar, the hero from the Hundred Year Battle. Ilwood's mentions investigating Duke Seraph, who is believed to have angel blood. The queen questions the belief in such fairy tales, and Ilwood's, removing his blindfold, explains that he needs something to rely on. He performs a magical act, asking the queen to touch the duke when the opportunity arises to discern if he is the one. He emphasizes that there is only one chance, and the queen inquires about the consequences if the duke isn't the chosen one. Ilwoods, blindfold back on, declares his intent to keep searching and suggests there might be a little time left. Someone reveals their face by pulling back their hood and expresses amazement at the lady. Her jeans joyfully identifies the person as Eppin, and the two warmly greet each other. Eppin inquires about her jeans well-being, prompting her jeans to question the delay in his return. Eppin explains that they had to evade pursuers and erase any traces connecting the bandits to House Targale. Hergines acknowledges this reality. The conversation shifts to Sean's lack of knowledge about Kalia, prompting Hergines to enlighten him. Sean, shocked by the revelation, expresses anger towards the perpetrators. Eppin, fearing Sean's reaction, witnesses Hergines trying to pacify him, asserting that it's all in the past. Hergines emphasizes the importance of concealing the identity of the person who ordered the assassination, revealing it to be Duke Seraph. Sean is further angered, regretting not killing the Duke earlier. Hergines advises against it, suggesting a more covert approach. Eppin agrees, calling the alternative reckless. Hergines proposes discreetly eliminating Duke Seraph, demonstrating a cutting motion. Eppin is taken aback by the cold-blooded nature of the main couple. Hergines suggests framing the Duke for the assassination, and Sean contemplates various methods of punishment. Eppin warns them about the Duke's power, questioning the legitimacy of their actions. Sean agrees nonetheless, and Eppin admits to lacking evidence of Duke Seraph's involvement. 
Sean presses him, and Eppin speculates that the information might have been leaked intentionally to prevent betrayal. Someone interrupts, bringing an important message from the palace about the activation of the teleporter, indicating the arrival of the Queen of Ryo. As the Queen and her entourage materialize, her genes is struck by a sense of familiarity. She observes the convergence of the two groups, recognizing similarities between them and characters from her previous life. The queen, focusing on her genes, leaves her bewildered. Her genes, feeling a connection, wonders how to explain this unusual encounter. The queen questions what her genes saw, leaving her confused and alarmed. Her genes contemplates hearing Korean and is puzzled by the queen's peculiar behavior. Time passes, and a grand party ensues, featuring Sean and his wife. Gossipy ladies comment on the mysterious absence of Sean's wife from previous events. The door creaks open, revealing Count Targale and the Countess in regal attire. The crowd reacts to their presence, and her jeans, feeling uneasy, tightens her grip on Sean. Sean reassures her, and they proceed hand in hand, earning surprised glances. The couple shares a moment, and Sean mentions the Queen's ceremony, prompting her jeans to reflect on the Queen's mysterious behavior. An array of desserts graces the table as murmurs circulate about the unexpected beauty of the Countess. A crowd converges around her jeans, speculating on the origin of her magnificent dress, possibly from Sofiana Boutique. Invitations to upcoming events are extended, creating a buzz around her jeans. Amidst this attention, an onlooker, visibly disgruntled, signals to a girl carrying drinks. Clenching the cups tightly, the girl rushes in, feigning a spill on her jeans. However, her jeans effortlessly evades the intended splash, twirling like a skilled dancer. The crowd gasps in astonishment, while someone catches the falling girl. The girl, revealed as Fiora from House Sensia, expresses gratitude to her jeans, who reassures her with a smile. Sean rushes to the scene, concerned, and questions her jeans. She assures him of her well-being, but Sean remains agitated, perceiving the incident as an attack. Her jeans playfully asserts her ability to dodge more significant threats. Fiora, grateful, sneaks away, leaving the main couple to ponder her departure. Trumpets announce the arrival of Prince Raymond, drawing attention to his highness. Duke Seraph follows, captivating the crowd with his usual perfection. Sean's anger simmers as her jeans advises him to calm down. Prince Raymond acknowledges the couple, and the prince and her jeans exchange pleasantries. Duke Seraph compliments her jeans, surprising the main couple. The duke, claiming to have met her at the palace, expresses his admiration for her beauty. Sean, protective, subtly confronts the duke about his interest in her jeans. The tension escalates as the prince observes the interaction. Puzzled by Sean's unusual reaction, the prince reflects on the apparent charm her jeans holds over both men. The duke extends his hand to her jeans, causing further irritation for Sean. Sean internally vows to confront the duke, while her jeans calmly contemplates the unfolding situation, questioning the motives of the two men beside her. Her jeans glances toward the prince, hoping he can intervene in the unfolding drama. To her surprise, the prince finds amusement in the situation, thoroughly enjoying the unfolding spectacle. As the pressure mounts, her jeans reluctantly raises her hand, realizing she has little choice in the matter. Sean, visibly agitated, Wonders if she is truly going to offer her hand to the duke. Inching her hand toward the duke's, her jeans becomes a focal point of the awkward encounter. The duke, acting inappropriately, kneels to kiss her hand, leaving her jeans repulsed. She internally recoils at the unpleasant experience, contrasting it with the comfort of being with Sean. The duke, persisting in his odd behavior, tightens his grip on her hand, prompting concern and anger from Sean. Her jeans, eager for release, wonders about the duke's intentions. Snatching her hand back, her jeans prompts an embarrassed reaction from the duke. Despite his unsettling advances, he invites her to his estate, intensifying her jeans' discomfort. Sean, stepping in, suggests that it's enough. The duke, seemingly oblivious, questions Sean's jealousy and hints at potential future actions. Tensions rise, with Sean contemplating a duel with the Duke, much to her jeans' dismay. Suddenly, trumpets blare, drawing attention to the arrival of Queen Ryohan. The room falls silent as the Queen and her entourage make a grand entrance. The crowd whispers about the Queen's appearance, speculating on her choices. As the Queen addresses someone named Rasun, the aide questions if she means her jeans. The Queen expresses disappointment in her jeans' marriage to Sean and the aide advises caution, stating the need for more information. Cecilia overhears discussions about Sean's name and translates the welcoming remarks to the queen. The queen acknowledges the warm welcome and asks for her jeans name. Her jeans, aware of the situation, remains silent, leaving Cecilia to interpret. Unexpectedly, Cecilia misrepresents the queen's words, claiming the queen finds her jeans impertinent. Confusion and murmurs spread through the crowd, creating diplomatic concerns. Despite the chaos, Sean tightens his grip on Herjean's hand, ready to defend her honor. Herjean's, feeling his concern, 
reassures him silently. Annoyed by the situation, she decides to take matters into her own hands, revealing her ability to speak the Ryo language fluently. The crowd is stunned, realizing the weasel interpreter likely manipulated the queen's words. The prince confronts the weasel, questioning her motives and emphasizing the diplomatic significance of the occasion. The weasel, caught in her deception, faces the consequences of her actions. The queen, surprised by her jean's linguistic skill, praises her ability, while the crowd grapples with the revelation. Whispers and murmurs fill the air as a group of people becomes the center of attention. Discussions revolve around House Eppernan's pride in interpreting the language of Ryo, with questions about Lady Cecilia's unexpected actions. In response, Hergenes raises her hand and addresses the prince, claiming a minor miscommunication between the languages. She reassures the prince that the situation is resolved, urging him not to worry. Despite Hergenes defending someone who attempted to deceive her, the prince agrees to let the matter go, curious about the underlying meaning. Internally smirking, her jeans clarifies that her defense was not for Cecilia but for Princess Island. She shoots a glare at Cecilia, emphasizing the gratitude owed to the princess. Infuriated, Cecilia grits her teeth, resenting her jeans for the humiliation. The prince decides to escort Cecilia back to the drawing room, considering her tired. The Count Epernin is left in silence as the prince requests her jeans to serve as the queen's interpreter for the rest of the evening. Sean, concerned, grabs her jeans' shoulder, but she reassures him and accepts the new responsibility. Her jeans, turning somewhat blue, senses Sean's unspoken questions, wishing they could leave the event. The queen, entering the scene, finds the country interesting and inquires about her jeans' husband. Her jeans questions the queen's language choice, leading to laughter from the queen, who reveals her proficiency in the official language. The queen asks her jeans to keep this a secret and leans on her for assistance in enjoying the ball. As time passes, the scene transitions to a full moon over the estate. Her jeans, exhausted, lies down. And Sean, with his abs on display, looks over her. Sean, silent for a moment, expresses surprise at Hergene's proficiency in the Ryo language. Hergene's, caught off guard, struggles with how to explain her ability without revealing her past life in Korea. Sean, perceptive, notes her secrecy and expresses a desire for trust. Hergene's, reflecting on her past concealment of her identity in battle, apologizes and promises to share her secrets someday. The two share a tender kiss, and Hergene's reaches out to touch Sean's face. He points out the unusual nature of her taking the lead in the kiss, and she responds by playfully flipping him over, suggesting a change in dynamics as they share a moment of connection. Her jeans, with a mischievous spark in her eyes, leans in and plants a soft kiss on Sean's lips, leaving him momentarily speechless. When she playfully asks him how it felt, Sean responds with a mixture of teasing and sincerity, admitting that her affectionate gestures make it feel as if he's being tortured. He humorously mentions the additional love rivals in the form of Duke Seraph and the Queen of Ryo, implying the complexity of their social dynamics. Undeterred, the couple shares another tender kiss. Her jeans, now in a playful mood, calls Sean cute and giggles at the confusion she's causing him. In a light-hearted manner, she apologizes, attributing it to Sean's undeniable adorableness. As the couple engages in this sweet banter, Sean confesses that he can't hold back any longer. This prompts her jeans to gently push him away, reminding him of their prior agreement. Such moments occur at her discretion. In this playful exchange, Sean realizes the existence of a contract and contemplates finding and burning it. Her jeans reassures him, expressing her own desires, and Sean, despite his earlier resolve, seems to find himself agreeing. The scene transitions to a dimly lit room with subtle hints of red objects, setting the stage for a more intimate connection between the two. Later, after what seems like the fulfillment of their desires, Sean, with a mix of satisfaction and longing, asks if he can move now. The couple shares a lingering gaze, and Sean, with a determined expression, declares his intention to hold onto her jeans throughout the night. His poetic remark about the length of the night emphasizes the depth of his feelings. Her jeans, in turn, admires his determination, and hearts float into the night sky from the window of their residence, symbolizing the love that fills the air. In the following scene, a tranquil moment unfolds as Sean's hand tenderly rests on her jeans head while she peacefully sleeps. He leans in for another gentle kiss, portraying a genuine and affectionate connection between them. The scene shifts to a cluttered desk, symbolizing the responsibilities that Sean bears. Calling for Marlo, his butler, Sean receives updates about Count Epernin. The butler informs Sean that the prince will question the count after the ceremonies, but affirms that House Epernin will continue managing interpretations. Sean, dissatisfied with this, instructs the butler to conduct more thorough research on House Epernin, even suggesting the possibility of creating a weakness if required. Intrigued by the upcoming festivities, Sean learns that the prince and princess won't be in attendance. However, the queen and her servants plan to join the event. 
The unexpected revelation that Duke Seraph will also be present catches Sean off guard, prompting him to cast a stern look at his butler, hinting at potential concerns or tensions surrounding the Duke's involvement. The approaching grand finale of the ceremonies is marked by a masquerade ball, an event where revelers can revel in anonymity, freed from the constraints of their identities. Scheduled for the evening, the ball promises an atmosphere of unbridled enjoyment, with attendees swathed in masks. For Sean, contemplating the surprising participation of the germaphobe and the duke is perplexing, especially considering the latter's abstention from prior banquets. The presence of the queen, however, compels Sean to attend despite his initial reluctance. Recollections flood Sean's mind particularly the Duke's peculiar obsession with blue eyes, leading to the mysterious disappearance of women possessing this trait. Initially dismissive, Sean now finds the Duke's unabashed pursuit of Herge deeply unsettling. Frustration bubbles within him, culminating in a forceful punch against the wall. His butler intervenes, urging Sean to exercise caution, given that the Duke's underlings are delving into their affairs. Sean reflects on the newfound attention directed toward Herge, envisioning her as a radiant gem under the sun. Despite his efforts to restrain himself, Sean vows to protect her at all costs if the Duke attempts anything untoward during the masquerade. As the night unfolds, Sean, now more composed, expresses concern about Herge's choice of attire. She wears a stunning black dress, prompting Sean to blush at her beauty. Their interaction reveals the couple's playful dynamic, with Sean openly admiring Herge's allure. The masquerade ball commences, featuring masked individuals gracefully dancing to the enchanting melodies of a violin. Observing Count Epernan and Celia appearing somewhat subdued, Sean suggests greeting the queen. However, he cautions against it, fully aware that doing so would bind Herge to royal duties. Amid the vibrant festivities, Sean engages Herge in a playful conversation about her dress. As the couple navigates through the crowded affair, Sean proposes fetching drinks. Herge, aware of the attention she attracts, hesitates momentarily. Sean reassures her, emphasizing the lack of modesty among the masked attendees. Leaving Herge momentarily, Sean issues a warning against following strangers. Left alone, Herge unexpectedly encounters Catinson Roble from the blacksmith shop, oblivious to the identities of those around him. Catinson insists on being recognized. Just as confusion begins to ensue, a glove is thrown at Sean, setting off a dramatic turn of events. Sean unveils his identity as Kyroxus of House Targale, accepting Catinson's challenge and setting the stage for a tense and captivating duel. Hergenes, realizing the severity of the situation, lets out an audible expression of concern as she witnesses the palpable anger emanating from Sean. While understanding his fury, she reflects on the curious paradox that she, too, would likely unleash such intensity if someone were to throw a glove at her. Meanwhile, Sean, standing imposingly over the now nervous Catinson, contemplates the duel that is about to unfold. Sean suggests the idea of stepping outside to settle the matter, causing a visible tremor of fear in Catinson. The unexpected intervention of the queen, who appears behind her jeans, prompts quick-thinking Cecilia to explain the custom of knights challenging each other to a duel. The queen, intrigued, expresses her curiosity about the might of Valwar's knights, redirecting both Sean and Catinson's attention toward her. Catinson, fervently defending the honor of the duel, challenges the queen's perception of the situation. Undeterred, the queen proposes to witness the duel, eager to gauge the strength of Valwar. Urgenes, caught up in the unfolding spectacle, contemplates the worsening circumstances and the inevitable clash that is about to transpire. As the crowd begins to buzz with anticipation, Hergenes, frustrated with the onlooker's comments, feels the tension rising, discreetly advising Sean to prolong the duel for the audience's entertainment. Her suggestion is met with amusement. The cups in her hands shatter, symbolizing her escalating exasperation with the unfolding events. The duel takes place under the vast, dark sky, with Sean and Catinson facing each other with swords drawn. Sean's nonchalance contrasts starkly with Catinson's visible tension. At the Queen's signal, the duel commences, with Sean strategically striking first. The fight unfolds with Sean deliberately slowing his pace, aligning with Hergene's counsel. Observing from the sidelines, Hergenes notes Sean's strategic approach with satisfaction, pleased that he is adhering to her advice. Amidst the duel's intensity, a man approaches Hergenes, delivering a message from Duke Seraph. Disinterested, she dismisses the messenger and focuses on the ongoing fight. As the swordplay intensifies, Hergenes is approached once again by the messenger, mentioning the Duke's persistent message, leaving her momentarily stunned. Turning to witness the dramatic conclusion of the duel, a resounding clang marks the end of the clash, with Sean emerging as the victorious party. However, his triumphant moment is unexpectedly overshadowed by the Queen's manipulative scheme, leaving Sean perplexed and urgently calling for his wife, Hergenes. Hergenes, her heart pounding with anxiety, paces as the name Herge of Eliza echoes in her mind. 
The revelation that Duke Seraph is aware of her true identity clenches her fists. She acknowledges the potential repercussions if this information were to become public. Stepping through the creaking door, she finds the Duke standing on the other side, extending a welcome with a seemingly friendly smile. As the door clacks shut behind her, her jeans discards her mask, and the Duke addresses her as Countess Targale. Lowering her eyes, she observes the room's table, where the Duke, with apparent ease, begins pouring tea. Cutting straight to the chase, her jeans urges him to get to the point, sensing an undercurrent of manipulation in his demeanor. The Duke, unfazed, insists that she will inevitably comply with his orders. Maintaining her composure, her jeans, internally advising herself to stay calm, questions his vague statement. The Duke, attempting to unsettle her, holds her necklace, asserting his dominance. Undeterred, she seizes his hand and pushes it away, making it clear she won't succumb to his games without a fight. In the ensuing silence, she requests permission to speak. With smiles exchanged, her jeans warns the Duke about underestimating her capabilities. She playfully brandishes a utensil, emphasizing that she wouldn't need such tools if she were truly Herge of Eliza, claiming she could inflict harm with her bare hands. The Duke's reaction, a mix of surprise and laughter, confuses her jeans, who maintains her enigmatic smile. The Duke, changing the tone, casually suggests the notion of a divorce, leaving her jeans shocked and fuming. His smirking demeanor prompts her internal fury, contemplating the audacity of his suggestion. The Duke, maintaining his composure, implies knowledge of her true identity, leading her jeans to confront the situation head-on. She demands to know how he discovered her secret and, perhaps more importantly, what he desires in exchange for maintaining her confidentiality. The atmosphere thickens as the tension between them reaches its peak. The Duke launches into an extensive soliloquy, waxing poetic about her jeans' distinctive blue eyes. He marvels not only at the enchanting hue but also the profound emotions and resolute will that radiate from her gaze. His impassioned admiration takes an unexpected turn, delving into the realm of personal satisfaction, including moments of happiness, anger, fear, and even pleasure. As he blushes at the last thought, her jeans is left both infuriated and bewildered. Grappling with the realization that the Duke's eccentricity far surpasses her previous assessments. Undeterred, the Duke transitions from his amorous musings to a formal proposal, professing his desire to spend eternity with her Jean. Stunned, her Jean's incredulously questions whether she heard him correctly. The absurdity of the proposition leaves her wondering if this individual, who already defies societal norms, is even capable of leading a normal life. The Duke, seemingly oblivious to the awkwardness, assures her jeans that he understands the weight of such a decision and pledges to prepare something exciting to aid her in making up her mind. Her jeans, unable to contain her frustration, erupts in vehement rejection. In her fantasy, she unleashes a barrage of blows on the Duke, labeling him with colorful expressions that convey her disdain. However, she resists the impulse, recognizing the consequences of attacking a nobleman of his stature. With an inward sigh, she attempts to regain composure through breathing techniques. The Duke, maintaining his smug demeanor, points out her jeans' untouched tea and proceeds to mention the preparations he made. Her jeans recoils, determined never to consume anything prepared by him. Swiftly, she rises, addressing him as her grace, firmly asserting her rejection. She warns the Duke not to underestimate her and slams a utensil onto the table. She emphasizes that any attempts to coerce her will be met with unintended consequences, delivered with a sly emphasis on accident. In a later scene, the atmosphere shifts as laughter echoes through the air, signaling the passage of time. Alone in the hallway, her jeans contemplates the potential fallout if her true identity as Herge were exposed. Worries about her brother Eschen and concerns for Sean Kyroxis weigh heavily on her mind. The narrative shifts to a musical backdrop as people revel in festivities. Her jeans, positioned on a balcony, searches for something or someone. A figure approaches and inquires if she's looking for her husband. Her jeans, addressing the queen, acknowledges Sean's victory. The queen reveals that Sean left hastily upon realizing her jeans' absence, likely searching for her in the gardens. The queen, accompanied by her head security Lee Rasson, discloses their intention to discuss a matter with her jeans. However, her jeans, bowing an apology, cites an urgent matter requiring her immediate attention. The queen, discerning her jeans' intent to find Sean, questions her feelings for him. Her jeans, caught off guard, blushes at the mention of Sean Kyroxis's name. The queen, sensing a deeper connection, directly asks if her jeans is truly in love with him. Her jeans stands in stunned silence, her expression reflecting a mix of confusion and disbelief at the abrupt change in the queen's demeanor. The queen, unfazed by her jeans's reaction, admonishes her not to surrender her heart entirely to Sean just yet. Rasson, the queen's advisor, discreetly advises against the queen's actions. Nevertheless, the queen, wearing a smile once more, bids her jeans farewell, leaving her in a state of bewilderment and pondering the unspoken words. In the enigmatic aftermath, her jeans finds herself in a garden adorned with a grand fountain. 
The ambient sounds reveal an intimate encounter nearby, prompting her genes to question the mysteries of the garden and whether Sean is searching for her there. She calls out his name, concerned about potential misunderstandings, but her search leads her to discover Sean, seated on a bench, visibly defeated, removing her mask. Her genes utters Sean's name softly, prompting him to grasp her wrist and pull her into a tight embrace. Overwhelmed, Sean pleads for her not to abandon him, expressing his fear of being left alone once more. Perplexed by his desperation, her genes wonders why a man of such wealth and prestige would cling so fervently to her. As Sean holds her tightly, her genes questions his motives. In response, Sean shares his initial confusion and frantic search for her, fueled by the fear that she had found someone else. He contemplated leaving her for the sake of her happiness but feared returning to loneliness. Opening his eyes, he recalls her reassuring words about their relationship not being one of possession. Standing together in the distance, Sean raises a haunting possibility. What if he were an orphan, a vengeful figure consumed by darkness? Her genes challenges him, asking why he speaks of his past as if it were someone else's. Sean admits that in the past, women had used and abandoned him, except for her genes, who remained a constant exception. Drawing closer, Sean confesses his love for her genes, but she redirects the conversation, demanding to know who the women from his past are. Fueled by righteous anger, her genes vows vengeance for any harm inflicted on her husband. Sean chuckles at her fiery determination, and she insists on taking action immediately. As Sean declares his love for her genes, they intertwine hands and lean in for a kiss, sealing their connection with an embrace visible from afar. In the recesses of her thoughts, the echo of Sean's declaration of love reverberates within her genes' mind. Cradling her flushed face, she contemplates the impact of those words, finding her heart racing in response. Her gaze shifts toward Sean, who exudes an air of calm collectedness, intensifying her perception of his handsomeness. Sean shifts the conversation toward Duke Seraph, speculating that the Duke might have uncovered her jean's identity during the Haglotten invasion. He surmises that Seraph wouldn't have acted without certainty, suggesting the possibility of spies during her jean's valiant stand against the enemies. Her jean's challenges this notion questioning the timing of Seraph's revelation and his intention to use it as a threat. Sean implies that Seraph's newfound interest in her genes arose from a personal encounter and speculates that Seraph and Haglotten are collaborating. Her genes expresses confusion, considering the familial ties between Seraph and the Imperial family. Sean, however, deems it peculiar for Seraph to take orders, hinting at a hidden agenda. When asked about the prince's ability to handle Sean, he responds with a playful shush, hinting at possible treasonous repercussions. The narrative then transitions to the passage of time, leading to the morning and a scene at a white and red building. A butler delivers the news that noblewomen must partake in a hunting competition, much to Sean's chagrin. The ensuing archery attempt showcase her jean's struggle with the bow. Amidst her frustration, she contemplates the absurdity of the competition and contemplates covertly using a sword or club for the task. The banter with her companions reflects the camaraderie among the characters. In a grand stadium, her jeans reluctantly attends a hunting competition, seated uncomfortably next to Duke Seraph. Despite her desire to focus on Sean's military parade, she finds herself adjacent to an undesirable companion. As Sean enters on horseback, she waves to him, momentarily forgetting Seraph's presence. However, Seraph's inappropriate comments remind her of the unwelcome company. The narrative then shifts to her jeans seated high in the stands, applauding the military parade she had intended to concentrate on. Her proximity to Duke Seraph, whom she deems literal human trash, adds a layer of discomfort to the experience. The focus then returns to Sean, who rides in on horseback, drawing her jeans' attention. As she waves to him, Duke Seraph comments on her eyes, further unsettling her. The scene concludes with her jeans enthusiastically dashing towards Sean as the crowd roars, culminating in a warm embrace and a kiss. Simultaneously, in another thread of the story, Queen Ryohan expresses concern to Rasan about Sean's delayed awakening and the energy suppression surrounding him. Speculating on the involvement of Duke Seraph, the Queen ponders contacting him, suggesting a humorous strategy involving an accidental push. Curiosity about her jeans' unusual behavior in the hunting competition fuels the Queen's suspicions, attributing it to an orchestrated banquet designed for her jean. A carriage arrives at a designated location, and the central couple, hand in hand, exchange gratitude. Her jeans expresses her thanks to Sean for accompanying her, to which Sean responds with nostalgic sentiments, remarking on the meaningful memories associated with the place. A subtle chuckle escapes her jeans, followed by a flashback. Unfolding in her mind, Sean inquires about the items her jeans intends to retrieve, prompting her to recall the completion of repairs on weapons such as the rapier, main gauche, stiletto, and bow for Raffi. As she looks up, she notices a figure in the distance, the knight from the previous party, Catons and Robel. 
His approach triggers a blush, and he greets her jeans as the lady. A silent exchange occurs between Sean and her jeans, leaving room for speculation. Catinson awkwardly acknowledges his recognition of Countess Targale, recalling seeing her with the Count at the ball. Her jeans, realizing the peril of her secret being exposed to yet another individual, contemplates the increasing danger. She contemplates having him disposed of, but Sean silently signals her to handle the situation. Contemplating her limited options, she reluctantly decides on having Catinson eliminated. However, before her decision materializes, the blacksmith interrupts, addressing Lord Kyroxus and Sean's intention to retrieve his wife's sword. The sudden revelation shatters Catinson's hopes. As Sean speaks, the atmosphere becomes tense, and Catinson continues to address her genes with a degree of familiarity. Her genes, in her head. Notes the necessity for Catinson to choose his words carefully to avoid a dire fate. Unexpectedly, Catinson reveals that he had never lost to anyone before her genes, attributing his defeat to arrogance. Sean's glare prompts Catinson to kneel and express admiration for her genes swordsmanship. Sean, aware of his wife's secret talent, intervenes, suggesting that Catinson join the Imperial Knights instead. The scene unfolds with Catinson pledging loyalty to her genes, much to Sean's amusement and her genes' disbelief. As Catinson walks away, Sean discloses his lack of genuine belief in the night, highlighting the effectiveness of false hope as a form of torture. Her genes, taken aback, acknowledges Sean's ability to play the role of a great villain. The narrative then shifts to a later scene, where a flag flutters in the air, and the Duke engages in conversation with Sean about the upcoming hunt. The Duke shares an anecdote about a beast that wouldn't die despite multiple attacks on its vital points. Sean, with a smirk, challenges the Duke to observe his hunting prowess, subtly questioning the Duke's ability to carry out a similar feat. Sean's inner anger and suspicions of a plot brewing add complexity to the unfolding events. A bag filled with prizes is casually dropped onto the ground, eliciting cheers and exclamations of amazement from the crowd. Sean stands impassively, surrounded by the captured prey, and the onlookers express their admiration for his impressive hull. Sean then steps forward, positioning himself in front of her jeans to the delight of the spectators. Embracing her, he inquires if he has met her expectations, to which she responds affirmatively, already confident of his victory. Passing her a towel, her jeans commends Sean for his exceptional performance. Sean leans in closer, teasingly asking if that's all. A spark of excitement lights up her eyes as they share a passionate kiss. Her jeans reflects on the audacity of the situation, aware of the audience watching them. Blushing, she contemplates the spectacle and acknowledges that, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't truly matter. Onlookers in the background react with surprise to the intensity of Sean's display of affection. Breaking away from the kiss, Sean, now holding a towel tightly, playfully declares that it's her jeans' turn. He encourages her to win promising to return the handkerchief and suggesting a reciprocated kiss. As Sean walks away, the prince praises his splendid performance, and her jeans, in her black attire, smiles from a distance. She notes that she now has an additional incentive to win the competition. The scene transitions to the aftermath of the event, with tents and cheering people visible. The rhythmic tapping of boots hints at Sean's restlessness as he anxiously awaits her jeans return. Concerned, he wonders if something could have happened to her. A white horse appears and Sean calls out his wife's name. Her jeans responds, revealing she was aware of his worry. However, the crowd begins to murmur disapprovingly, suggesting disappointment that she returned empty-handed. Amidst the whispers, a cart rattles into view, and her jeans gestures to a legion of carts loaded with prey. The crowd gasps, realizing the extent of her success. Her jeans playfully admits to going a bit overboard. And Sean, draping his cape over her, expresses his admiration and lifelong reverence. The prince commends the Targale house for contributing to the empire's success and invites them to the banquet. Her jeans raises a glass, relieved that no foul play occurred during the hunting competition. The queen of Ryo praises her skills, and her jeans thanks her for the kind words. The princess expresses admiration for her jeans' hunting prowess and curiosity about her secret. To avoid the crowd, her jeans suggests taking a stroll elsewhere. Later, footsteps and the shadows of the two ladies are heard, along with the princess discussing the importance of hounds and hunting. As they walk, the princess asks about the water flask her jeans is carrying, and upon offering some water, the atmosphere changes. Suddenly, a hound aggressively rushes toward the princess, prompting her jeans to act in a protective manner. More hounds appear, growling menacingly, and a violent encounter ensues, leaving Eileen in a state of horror and shock. Droplets persist for a moment, and we witness the two hounds that assailed her jeans lying on the ground. Her jeans, her arm wounded, appears pallid as she confronts a growling hound. The scene unveils a disconcerting reality. Seven more hounds fixate on her, struggling with her injured arm. She contemplates the impossibility of extracting the stiletto, pondering whether she can fend off this pack without a weapon. Meanwhile, Eileen trembles in fear 
and Hergenes grapples with the dual responsibility of safeguarding the princess. Hergenes, pressing harder on her wound, laments the absence of a proper sword. Unexpectedly, a voice calls her name, and a sword spins into view. In complete surprise, she leaps into the air, grasping the sword mid-flight. Descending rapidly, she executes a powerful slash, spraying liquid around. Her jeans, covering her right eye from the splatter, becomes a force in the midst of the skirmish. Sean hurries in, calling her name, and men follow him to assist in repelling the hounds. Sean reaches her jeans, embracing her tightly. In the aftermath, Sean carries her with one arm, unleashing a barrage of attacks against the remaining hounds. Silent and determined, Sean navigates through the forest, leaving a murmuring crowd behind. Under the partially lit moon, people outside a tent murmur about the countess. A doctor remarks on the presence of poison in the hound's fangs, expressing concern over the lack of an immediate antidote. Sean, alarmed, watches as the doctor tends to Hergene's wound. Despite the impending pain, the doctor proceeds with disinfection. Hergene's, her arm exposed, faces increasing discomfort. Sean, apologetic, holds her firmly, and a sudden thump in her heart is audible. A hissing sound accompanies her scream as she succumbs to the agony. Time passes, and red bandages and medication bottles on a table indicate ongoing treatment. Sean touches her face, noting her unconscious state, his eyes now ablaze with fury. He vows to find and punish the perpetrator responsible for her suffering. A group gathers near a tent, and the Duke expresses disappointment, berating someone for causing harm to her genes. He is particularly upset that she was injured instead of Sean. Venting his frustration physically, the scene shifts to Sean, angrily swearing to confront and dismantle the responsible party. Later, Hergene's troops are distraught, calling for their captain. The butler informs Hergene's that Sean has left for the palace, motivated by the princess's safety. Tarkun and Raphine encourage Hergene's, emphasizing her importance to Eliza. Sean rushes into the room, kneeling beside her, and she reassures him of her improved condition. The butler and crew discreetly exit, allowing the couple a private moment. With teary eyes, Sean addresses her as Herge, pleading with her never to endanger herself again. He urges her to prioritize her safety, emphasizing the importance of her well-being to him. Hergenes apologizes and inquires if Sean discovered the perpetrator. Sean reveals that Count Eppernan has been accused, but he suspects the true culprit is Dookie Seraph. Hergenes, astonished, seeks more information about the unfolding conspiracy. Sean cradled his wife's face tenderly while reflecting on the two days she remained unresponsive. Amid the torrent of thoughts and anger swirling within him, a newfound determination stirred. He appeared to cast aside reservations, expressing a fierce desire to confront everyone. The accusation of treason rang out as someone pointed a condemning finger at Count Eppernan, unraveling the truth. Steps echoed as it was announced that the Count would face trial, and upon judgment, he would lose his title, facing a public execution. Sean, unfazed by the commotion, walked away, prompting someone to call out for him. As Sean turned to face the commotion, Duke Wade approached, seeking a moment of his time. Discussing Count Eppernan, Sean interjected, questioning why House Targale would consider aiding Eppernan given the harm inflicted on his wife. Duke Wade acknowledged Sean's sentiments, expressing his own disdain for Eppernan. Despite Sean's silence, Duke Wade conveyed his belief that punishing Eppernan for a crime he may not have committed was unjust. He disclosed his suspicions about the true culprit, uttering the name Dookie Seraph, causing Sean to react with surprise. Sean expressed disbelief, arguing that Dookie Seraph wouldn't target his sister. Duke Wade concurred and revealed concerns about the Duke's recent peculiar behavior. Despite Sean's initial speechlessness, he extended a helping hand to Duke Wade, insisting that Eppernan's title be forfeited even if he were innocent. Sean's eyes glowed with purple intensity, and his figure took on a shadowy presence. He inquired whether Duke Wade still sought his assistance, leaving the Duke nervously considering the prospect of making a deal with the devil. Wade acquiesces with a firm grip on Sean's hand. While walking away, Sean contemplates his suspicion that Dookie Seraph is hatching a plot. He questions why Dookie, whom he believed had taken a liking to Herge, would be involved. The unexpected inclusion of his sister, the princess, in the attack adds to his confusion. Sean resolves to seize the opportunity to eliminate both Eppernan and Dookie Seraph, describing it as dealing with two idiots in one go. Clenching his fist, he swears to prevent these individuals from ever approaching Herge again. As smoke billows into the air, Sean's determination intensifies. Switching scenes, the queen leisurely sits as smoke rises, appearing contemplative. Concerned, Rassan approaches, expressing worry about the queen's health, having noticed her prolonged contemplation. The queen, sighing, asks Rassan if she should visit the girl, referring to the countess. Confirming this, the queen reveals that when her genes was injured, she used Ilwood's powers to inspect Dookie Seraph. 
However, recounting the encounter causes the queen's distress, specifically mentioning the intensity of Dookie's eyes. A close-up of Dookie's frenzied eyes is depicted, sending shivers down the queen's spine. Despite Sean being confirmed as the actual person, the queen finds Dookie's gaze more terrifying. She adamantly refuses to believe someone like him could be the culprit and trembles at the thought. Rassen brings up the unknowable will of God, but the queen forcefully rejects the idea, slamming her hand on the desk and saying no. She vehemently declares her refusal to believe that he could be the one, prompting Rassen to suggest reaching out to Illwoods to identify other candidates. The queen dismisses this idea, asserting that Illwoods is mere speculation. Lost in thought about her genes bravely facing the wolves, she proposes a visit to House Targale. In their residence, a spoonful of food is presented by Sean, urging her genes to say ah. Despite her insistence that she can eat on her own, Sean, radiating affection, smiles, leaving her to think it's acceptable. Her genes dips her feet into water while Sean playfully attends to them. In a light-hearted moment, Sean's hand moves up her calf, causing her to blush as he proceeds with a playful lick. Her jeans, caught off guard, twitches and mumbles Sean's name, unable to complete her sentence due to his action. As they share a brief, intense gaze, Sean and her jeans share a kiss. Their intimate moment is abruptly interrupted by the butler, who urgently announces the arrival of the Queen of Ryo, leaving the couple stunned. Our story resumes with the entrance of the butler, who announces the presence of her jeans and Sean. Sean introduces her jeans with a touch of sarcasm, playfully declaring her the Queen of Ryo. The Queen gracefully takes her seat, emanating a sociable demeanor. Despite her royal charm, Sean and her jeans remain visibly tense, their alertness apparent. Initiating the conversation, the Queen expresses a sense of nostalgia, inquiring about her jeans' well being. Her jeans responds with gratitude, assuring the Queen that she is feeling much better. The Queen then shifts her gaze to Sean, detecting an air of discontent. Her jeans nervously attempts to defuse the tension, but the queen dismisses it, presenting a collection of thoughtful gifts for her jeans, brushes, hairpins, fans, and a vase. Her jeans admires the rarity of the items, expressing her appreciation. Notably, the queen observes her jeans' familiarity with a particular item, finding it unusual given the general lack of awareness in the country. Swiftly, her jeans changes the subject, downplaying the opulence of the gifts. The queen reveals that she has personally witnessed her jeans' formidable swordsmanship, prompting a moment of reflection for her jeans. She trembles at the thought of others witnessing her skills on the battlefield. The queen, displaying an understanding demeanor, assures her jeans that she won't pry further into the matter. As a surprising turn of events, the queen unveils another gift, the legendary Illwood's holy powers, claiming it can instantly heal her jeans. Her jeans protests, deeming such a rare gift too extravagant. Amid the escalating commotion, Sean steps in, passionately pleading for the queen to heal his beloved wife. Following the miraculous healing, the queen's demeanor undergoes a sudden and drastic change. She staggers backward, proclaiming her jeans as the one. This revelation leaves both Sean and her jeans in a state of bewilderment, questioning the true meaning behind the queen's cryptic statements. Seeking clarity, the queen quizzes Rassan about the current year, disclosing a pivotal date three years away. Accusing Sean of being in love with her jeans, she initiates a tense confrontation. Sean, however, unabashedly confesses his deep love for her jeans, frustrating the queen. As the queen decides to depart, expressing her frustration at the unforeseen turn of events, Sean directs an angry growl her way. Her jeans, still grappling with confusion, watches the queen's departure. Later, the queen confers with Illwoods, revealing her belief that Sean Kyroxus is the supposed devil destined to destroy the continent. The narrative interjects with humor, questioning the sanity of labeling Sean a devil when, as of yet, he hasn't committed any devilish deeds. Someone's hand tightly grips a brush as questions about the mention of a devil linger in the air. A fellow student approaches Herge's brother, engaging in a discussion about the impending arrival of a devil coinciding with the new millennium. The revelation sparks curiosity among the people prompting discussions and theories fueled by the NX priests. Eschen, Herge's brother, contemplates the information, and his friend notices the intensity of his reaction, leading to an inquiry about his thoughts. Eschen reflects on the rarity of encountering an NX priest, a sentiment echoed by his friend, who mentions the increasing frequency of priest sightings. As they discuss their studies and the prospect of learning more about the priests, a new character, Lady Wade, enters the scene, calling out to Eschen. He politely excuses himself, leaving his friend to comment on his recent interactions with Lady Wade. 
The narrative shifts to Eshin and Lady Wade walking down a bustling hall, where she suggests finding a quieter place. Outside, near the walls, Lady Wade expresses concern for Eshin's well-being and leads the conversation toward Countess Targiel. Eshin, bewildered, responds with a hesitant pardon, prompting Lady Wade to reveal the shocking news about Countess Targiel being wounded in a recent hunting competition. The revelation leaves Eshin in a state of shock, and he immediately questions if something has happened to his sister. Lady Wade, surprised that her genes hadn't informed him, covers her mouth and delicately reveals the truth, expressing her desire not to cause unnecessary worry. In the dreamlike sequence, Hergenes experiences sensations of darkness and coziness. Confused yet intrigued, she wonders if Sean is present, leading to a passionate kiss and even a French kiss. However, as the dream intensifies, a bright flash occurs, and a mysterious voice declares the emergence of a devil named Sean Kyroxus, destined to destroy the continent. Hergenes awakens with a gasp, sitting upright in bed, disoriented and still processing the vivid dream. The urgency to check on Sean overwhelms her, and she rushes out of her room. In the dimly lit halls, Hergenes contemplates the surreal nature of her dream and debates whether it was a mere fantasy. Unable to resist her concern, she decides to peek into a room, only to be met with a chilling voice questioning her presence. To her surprise, Sean is found seated at his desk, and the couple shares a heartfelt moment. As they embrace, Sean apologizes for not staying by her side, expressing genuine concern for her well-being. The conversation transitions to Sean's upcoming trial involving Count Epernan, revealing the challenges they face. Hergenes, still troubled by the dream and the mysterious voice, seeks solace in Sean's company. The Queen's enigmatic behavior earlier in the narrative remains a puzzle, and the couple reflects on the unsettling events. Hergenes, dismissing the Queen's desires, asserts her choice to stay by Sean's side, sealing her commitment with a tender kiss on his cheek. This unexpected gesture leaves Sean flustered, triggering a scattering of papers on the table. As Sean holds her jeans near the table, a poignant and heartfelt conversation ensues, emphasizing the depth of their connection and the uncertainties surrounding the mysterious events. Sean's suggestion to engage in intimate activities in his office catches Herge off guard. She questions the appropriateness of the location, reminding him that they are in his workplace. Undeterred, Sean takes her hand, delivering a surprising kiss on her cheek while smoothly slipping his hands into action. Expressing impatience, he notes that it's been a while, and he can no longer wait. He gazes at Herge's face, expressing his satisfaction that she's ready for the moment. This prompts a humorous flashback for her genes to an embarrassing dream she had earlier, eliciting a comedic expression from her. Encouraged by Herge's reaction, Sean initiates further moves, and with a hint of exasperation, her genes encourages him to proceed. Sean, huffing and panting with anticipation, leans in for another kiss, leaving her genes blushing with a teardrop, reminiscent of Sean's heartfelt declaration of love earlier. Their lips meet again, and her genes, now teary-eyed, questions the sincerity of Sean's affection. Sean, in a passionate embrace, reassures her, affirming his deep love and acknowledging her indispensable role in his life. The couple shares another tender kiss, and with a regretful tone, Sean suggests moving the remainder of their intimate moments to their room. Her genes, reflecting on Sean's insatiable desires, playfully dubs him the devil. The scene transitions to Sean peacefully snoozing, while her genes lies next to him, visibly exhausted. The tranquil moment is interrupted by a knock on the door, with someone urgently calling for Lord Kyroxus. Instantly alert, Sean covers her genes with blankets and inquires about the disturbance, leaving her genes bewildered, questioning if Sean had been awake the entire time. The unexpected visitor is announced as Master Eschen prompting surprised expressions from both Sean and Hergenes. Eschen enters, visibly concerned about Hergenes' well-being, shedding tears and questioning why she didn't inform him about her injury. Hergenes apologizes, explaining her intention to spare him worry during his exams. The emotional reunion unfolds, with Eschen expressing regret for raising his voice. Observing the scene, Sean instructs his butler to prepare some tea. In the ensuing silence, Eschen inquires about the source of Hergenes' healing. She confirms that the Queen of Ryo, using Ilwood's holy power, healed her. Eshin finds this information implausible, noting that usually, only priests have access to such powers. He reflects on the mysterious nature of the kingdom of Ryo, leaving everyone in contemplative silence. Trying to lighten the mood, Hergene suggests places Eshin might want to visit, given that he has come all this way. Eshin then produces a letter, revealing a request that prompts him to visit Duke Wade's manor. The scene shifts to the Duke reading the letter, unveiling Lady Wade's desire to marry Eshin. 
The Duke, overwhelmed with emotion, calls Eschen and openly asks if he would like to marry his daughter. Eschen, blushing and dumbfounded, responds with a loud and resonant huff, causing the sound to echo through the entire building. As Hergines maintains her composure, the assailant, disarmed and surprised by her swift actions, attempts to negotiate. Holding a blade and a tiny bottle, he explains that the contents of the bottle would induce a dreamlike sleep without harm if she obediently consumed it. Her genes, with a sparkle of innocence, suggests that she might forget everything if she drinks it, teasing the possibility of cooperation. However, the assailant firmly refuses, claiming it would be difficult to answer her question. Undeterred, Hergines proposes a compromise. She lifts the drink, suggesting that she could forget everything after consuming it, to which the assailant smirks, thinking he can now assert control over her. However, Hergines surprises him by diverting the drink towards her mountains, leaving the assailant stunned and bewildered. He protests, questioning her actions, while Hergines calmly states that she is merely securing evidence. The scene then shifts back to the palace, where Sean is engaged in discussions. Meanwhile, Hergines is alone in the hall, cautiously surveying her surroundings. Grateful that nobody is present, she reflects on the suspicious events unfolding. A sense of vigilance guides her actions as she navigates the dimly lit corridor. The narrative then returns to Duke Wade's proposal for Eschen and Haley. Hergines, still processing the unexpected turn of events, vocalizes her concern for her younger brother. Sean, taking the initiative, assures her that he will handle the matter when he visits the palace. Hergines, contemplating her sibling's future, appreciates Sean's involvement and expresses her trust in him. As Sean prepares to leave, Ivana bows to the departing Count, leaving Hergines and Ivana alone. Curious about the outcome of Ivana's mission, Hergines inquires about the information she gathered. Ivana reveals that the situation requires an interrogation, and she entrusted Epin with the task, using Majahog flowers known for their hallucinogenic properties. Hergines, acknowledging the significance of the information, thanks Ivana for her efforts and commitment to their cause. The narrative then transitions to the royal palace, where the weary princess emotionally reaches out to her genes. The princess, grappling with nightmares and sleepless nights, seeks solace and asks for a favor. Her genes, compassionate and understanding, grants her request to spend the night together. As Sean questions her decision, her genes reassures him, emphasizing the peculiar behavior of the princess. Sean, caring and protective, decides to stay by her side, working overtime at the palace to ensure her well-being. The evening unfolds as a maid serves tea, and the princess offers Hergines a cup. Hergines declines, and the princess bids her good night. Alone in the room, Hergines ties up her hair as the maid places a cup of tea before her. The maid, acting as a messenger, informs her that the princess has sent the tea, describing it as rare and encouraging Hergines to try it. Hergines, cautiously considering the circumstances, expresses her gratitude to the maid. In the following scenes, Hergines observes the events unfold within the palace, unveiling a plot against the princess. Suspicious of the situation, she remains vigilant and prepares to confront the potential threat. The narrative masterfully weaves suspense, intrigue, and the character's individual strengths, setting the stage for the next chapters of the unfolding story. The assailant lunges at Hergines, shouting that she asked for trouble. However, with incredible agility, Hergines not only skillfully dodges the attack, but also effortlessly flips behind her attacker. Seizing his arm, she flips him over and hurls him to the ground, the impact resonating with a loud thud. The defeated man, now seated at a distance, clutches his arm, trembling in pain. Hergines, displaying a playful demeanor, informs him that she'll be taking his weapon. The man, dumbfounded, pleads for mercy, to which she responds that she won't kill him, but promptly delivers a resounding whack to his head, cautioning him not to blame her if he ends up worse. Groaning and foaming at the mouth, the man lies defeated. Returning to the princess, Hergines gently uncovers her and reassures her that it's all over, dispelling any lingering fear. The princess, with tears in her eyes, queries if it wasn't a dream, expressing relief when Hergines confirms it was real. Overwhelmed, the princess questions her own actions, but Hergines consoles her, affirming that the nightmare has come to an end. The two embrace, providing solace and comfort in the aftermath of the harrowing ordeal. Hergines reflects on the princess's long-standing suffering, concealed by the habit of hiding her neck. Contemplating the involvement of servants in this sinister plot, Hergines wonders about her course of action. Steps approach from behind, 
prompting her jeans to swiftly flip her blade, ready to confront an intruder. The tension heightens as the door opens, revealing someone familiar. Her jeans recognizes the person, intensifying the suspense. As the scene shifts, Sean, gazing out at the moonlit night, is approached by Duke Wade with an unexpected smile. Surprised by the Duke's unusually jubilant demeanor, Sean inquires about his well-being. They engage in a conversation about Epernan's trial and Sean's efforts to expose Duke Seraph. Sean, emanating a dark aura, expresses his willingness to confront the formidable Duke Seraph directly, revealing a side that catches Duke Wade off guard. Discussing the marriage proposal to Eschen, Sean brings up the topic with Duke Wade, who enthusiastically supports the idea. Duke Wade, visibly excited, envisions it as the romance of the century and eagerly suggests arranging the engagement soon. Sean, visibly uncomfortable, agrees to discuss it with his wife. The Duke, unaware of Sean's internal thoughts, revels in the prospect of this grand union. Amid the paperwork and exhaustion, Sean contemplates the complexities of the situation involving an anti-imperialist faction representative and a member of the imperialist faction both from different social standings. He wonders how Eschen managed to charm Lady Haley Wade and expresses his confusion over the entire scenario. The narrative then shifts to Sean's frustration with the excessive workload imposed by Raymond, preventing him from spending time with his wife. An interruption occurs as a messenger informs Sean about a maid seeking an audience with the Count. Urgently allowing her entry, Sean recognizes the woman as Lady Fiora, sent by Lady Hergines. In an earlier scene, two mysterious figures, shrouded in hoods, bow respectfully to Hergines, assuring her that they will handle the remaining tasks. Lady Fiora then directs the princess to spend the night in a nearby bedroom, grateful for Fiora's timely intervention. Hergines expresses relief, acknowledging that the situation could have spiraled out of control if another maid had discovered them. Fiora, wearing a warm smile, modestly dismisses Hergines' gratitude, stating that she was merely glad to be of service. As dawn breaks over the palace, Hergines and the princess rest peacefully, recovering from the night's ordeal. The princess, appreciating the tranquility she experienced, acknowledges her indebtedness to Hergines for ensuring her peaceful sleep. Her jeans, in her usual playful manner, brushes off the praise, attributing her actions to a sense of duty. The narrative then transitions to the princess dressing for the day. Nervously, she confides in her jeans, revealing shocking truths about the Seraph family. Enoch Seraph, the sinister orchestrator behind the scenes, is responsible for the demise of the late Duke and Duchess. The princess, painted as an illegitimate child, shares the harrowing tale of her past, marred by the late Duchess's hostility, and attempts on her life. The princess discloses the emotional torment inflicted by Enoch's, emphasizing his lack of understanding of human flaws and relentless pursuit of perfection. The revelation continues, with the princess confessing that she and Enoch's are only half-siblings. The late duke had brought her home, leading to conflicts with the late duchess, who harbored resentment towards her. The princess narrates her struggles and unveils Enoch's insidious plan to manipulate and break her psyche. This revelation leaves Hergines contemplating the complexities of noble marriages and the shadows lurking behind seemingly perfect families. Seeking refuge from Enoch's clutches, the princess implores Hergines for assistance, expressing her desire to break free from the puppeteer's control. Their alliance solidifies as they plan their escape. Later in the day, a carriage travels through the streets, carrying Sean and Hergines in solemn silence. Hergines, acknowledging the worry she caused Sean, apologizes for the concern. Sean, with a smirk, praises her efficient handling of the situation, expressing confidence in her capabilities. As their hands entwine, Sean admits his distrust of the princess, attributing it to the ominous events surrounding her. Hergines playfully reveals a bottle containing a hallucinogenic substance consumed by the princess, teasing Sean about its intriguing properties. She proposes confronting Duke Seraph with the newfound information. The scene shifts to a dark building, where Reeve Collins, identified as the man who confronted Hergines, descends the stairs singing. A mysterious figure below, addressed as the butler, inquires about the unusual song. Reeve dismisses the query with a carefree attitude. The butler, harboring resentment for Reeve's actions against their madam, reviews the damning evidence. Intent on extracting information, the butler instructs Reeve to ensure the captive can speak. In a suspenseful moment, the doofus prisoner pleads for mercy, promising to divulge everything. The tension in the dark building builds, culminating in a cry that echoes through the shadows. Duke Seraph rushed towards Enox. He said, It's been a while, hasn't it, Duke Seraph? If you could spare a moment of your time, there is something I would like to discuss, Duke mumbled and raised his hand, 
asking him to lead the way. They both sat down. Duke said he thinks of her blue eyes every single night. He asked him about his wife. Enox twitched his teeth and said he has spent passionate nights with her while he was doing that. They both glared at each other. Enox told Duke that he had heard something interesting recently. Duke thinks that apparently there is some perverted servant in the palace who goes around choking his victims. He asked him if he had heard about this. Duke clenched his fist. He thought, did that brainless idiot get captured by house target of all people? Enox smirked at him. It was completely spontaneous. He bet that he didn't expect Herge to stay at the princess's palace all of a sudden. Herge's decision created a weak spot for him. Enox stated that a week from now at Hyperion Restaurant and asked him for dinner. Hergene slammed documents on the table. I'm stepping outside for a moment, she addressed Sean. Sean intriguingly asked her, where are you going dressed like that? Hergene reassuringly stated, come on, I'm heading out with Eliza. She heard there are rumors that Duke Seraph takes away all the courtesans who have blue eyes, and she wanted to check out the Pleasure District real quick. You can just have one of your men do that, Sean suggested. Sean, with an intense gaze, called her name Herge. Tell me the truth, Hergeen said to Sean, I want closure for your past, sweating due to nervousness. The woman who tormented you the first time is in the Pleasure District, Hergeen revealed. A moment of silence took place. Her genes started pondering, that woman is the source of Sean's trauma. She wanted to help him decide whether he wants to face it or cover it up. Sean pondered about his past for a moment. Then he grabbed Her Jeans' shoulder and stated they will go together. In the carriage, Her Jeans inquired, how's the investigation going? Sean reassured Her Jeans, I left it to Reeve. You needn't worry. She verified about Reeve by stating his full name, Sir Reeve Collins. He is an expert in the field, Sean uttered. Her jeans admired him, calling him cute. Sean glared at her. Your past, it's not really important to me, to be honest, her jeans expressed. Sean, in deep thought, pondered, I already knew she was there. He didn't leave her alone because he forgave her or wanted to forget. It doesn't mean anything to me anymore, he added. Oh, I see, her jeans comprehended. Sean, with a smile on his face however, if you say you wish to stand for me, that's a completely different story. He grabbed her jeans by her hand, lifted her into his lap. Her jeans, flabbergasted by his move, gazed into her eyes and expressed his feelings, you are like a rope to me. A rope? Her jeans in awe, her eyes wide open. You tightened around me like a lasso and hold on so I don't get swept away by the void, he added passionately. Sean gently kissed her hand and stated, Sometimes I love the feeling of you holding on to me so much. Her hand got bitten passionately. I never want you to let go. By making a bite mark on her hand, he gazed into her eyes, hold on to me tighter. The romantic speech made her jeans feel teary. While blushing she started smashing her head on him and inquired, Where did you learn to say stuff like that? I was only saying how I truly feel, he reassured her. Their romantic moment was interrupted when the carriage collided with something. Outside individuals were having an argument. Her jeans wondered, are those Ivana's and Turkana's voices, and if they were fighting? Carriage door opened abruptly, ABC appeared with an apology stated, it seems like they have to walk from here. While walking through the street, glancing at the homeless individuals, Cullens uttered, they should be careful of them as they have nothing to lose. He assured, we should be able to take them out easily. I'll brief you on the situation while we are on the way, he whispered to her jeans. Apparently, Cecilla was unable to bear a child. Her husband still tried to accept her as she was, but divorced her in the end due to her countless infidelities, he added. She must have sold her body in order to maintain her wealthy lifestyle and ended up here, he pointed at the place. Inside, the owner welcomed them, reflecting on them as customers. He pondered, you can tell they're nobles at a glance, but the fact that they've come to a place like this means they've got some strange hobbies. What's your type? Her jeans asked the owner. This could get ugly, the owner retorted. She dropped the money onto the table with a thud and asked for Lavia. The owner got baffled and muttered, just one person, but why would they choose her of all people? He gulped in shock and thought he might end up with a corpse tonight. Then he asked them to follow him. 
they entered a room where her jeans found some tools and a single bed. Then Lavia walked into the room. She bowed and offered her service by stating, it's an honor to serve such distinguished guests. She got stunned when she looked up to find Sean standing in front of her. By looking into his beautiful sparkling violet eyes, she affirmed he must be Sean. Oh Sean, you'll rescue me from this hell, won't you? She beamed with joy. Unexpectedly, she was kicked by her jeans. I've had enough, her jeans stated. What the hell do you think you are doing to my husband? Her jeans shouted. Lavia's eyes opened with astonishment. She reflected on the past when younger Sean told her he did not remember his parents' faces, but he was sure they would be as kind-looking as Miss Lavia. Lavia gently placed her hand on his head and promised him she'd take good care of him. Later on, Sean was tied and Lavia stated, It's all his fault. His eyes made me go mad. She confessed, It's my fault that John became this way because of me and he was kicked out all of a sudden. After that, no matter who I met, I kept thinking about you, she admitted. That's why you are here, isn't it? You missed me, right? You still remember my name after all, she inquired. Her jeans landed a slap on her face. I said get your hands off my husband, her jeans shouted. What's with this woman? Instead of showing any remorse for all the pain she caused Sean, she's acting like she's reuniting with her first love, her jeans bewildered. Sean married to this tomboy of all people? Lavia astonishingly questioned. This must be a forced marriage. There is no way Sean would be happy without me, Lavia pondered. Her jeans flinched with a fake smile. Lavia, with an evil smile, inquired, Tell me, isn't it true? Or else I'll whip you. She stated she won't give a single drop of water to Sean for three days and urged him to tell her how much he loves her. Her jeans landed a hard slap on Lavia's face. She seized Lavia by her hair and stated, There's something I realized while going up against crazy people recently. They need to be punished. Stop, stop, Lavia yelled in agony. Her jeans said to Lavia, Why should I? You enjoyed hurting children but now can't take what you dish out. Lavia, with a hand on her purple cheek, replied, That was just discipline. I was showing my love through discipline. What will happen next? Stay tuned to our channel for all the excitement, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy the upcoming content, and have a great day. It's so cool.